Chapter 81 10 hours in negotiation already. Are they serious or just stalling? What do you think, Charlie? Asks the representative from one of the villages near ours to me. Let's find out, I reply. As the de facto leader of the strongest village, and the one whole contributed the most to the army, I was the obvious choice to head the negotiations. Though I took a step back from the minutiae of the contract while a couple of people with more experience in the world of law sank their teeth in the minutiae of the contract. I approached the comm box and signal for them to stop for a moment. We are getting sidetracked. We will finish this in a couple of hours or not at all. Unless you demonstrate some willingness to sign the contract, it will be a moot point. I say, but how can we do that? They reply, well, I say grinning, you can just sign another document that states you are genuinely interested in this deal. And should the terms be equitable, you will sign it. We will also put a time limit, say, another three hours. For the next half hour, I push until the contract arrives signed and recognized under the system back from the village. Now, they won't be able to stall for much longer. My patience is starting to run thin. The problems from keeping so many disparate forces around are starting to crop up. Luckily, the noose around Lord Max's neck was getting tighter. Lord Max's throne room. Well, it seems I won't be able to stall any longer, though the deal was not bad. The major things have been agreed to with only a few details were left in the air. It was strange to be setting terms of our following fight. I don't know why they took this stance, but they gave me this opportunity, and I will make full use of it. I will be signing the final document soon and be bound to these terms, but so would they. If it was obvious who would win, the other side was obligated to surrender or face the system sanctions. Perhaps I can even steal this framework for my conquests. The main reason for this action had probably a lot to do with minimizing their losses. After all, no matter how weak our forces are, thousands of soldiers will be able to put a serious din in their attacking force. Even being pessimistic, I may even be able to break the command and control structures they have in place. The mixed forces from more than a dozen villages are not used to working together. There is bound to be some way to exploit that. In the end, they want to have me sign the contract and are giving fairly generous terms. That doesn't mean I won't continue fighting to extract the most benefit should I win, and the least restrictive conditions should I lose. The one thing I am a little concerned about is that much of the wait for the opinion on who would win was predicated on the rank and file soldiers, but I can manage. I have plenty of cards up my sleeve, so we had a good chance. Especially if I get a third new village before the attack. The first two already showed up in the interface. Now all I have to do is wait for the next one. Nash, I hear someone from behind calling me. Cracking a small opening in the cocoon and using a bit of mana to light my view. I prompt. Hum. Hi, says the messenger. He's one from our village. Though I can't recall his name, we probably never even spoke to each other before. Charlie asked to inform you that things are on track to finish in about an hour, and the attack will begin immediately after. You may want to get a little rest. It has been 13 hours since we got here. One hour is plenty of time to rest. I thank him before stopping most of what I'm doing. I connect deeply to Pando but don't use any ether or mana. I even stop my experimentation on the sensory rune. I concentrate only on meditating, waiting until the time for me to act. I am guessing, but it seems clear to me what their intentions are. Have me scare the crap out of the enemy and force a surrender without sending a single soldier in. I pull deep within myself and soon my awareness extends to the village. Every single route in a mile radius becomes part of me, and I drink in the sensations. Resting this way appears to be even more effective than just normally meditating. I can't push my awareness too far out, but I can cover everything except the tendril extending back to my village easily enough. Idly, I look over my inner world. If before it was nearly stuffed to the brim with roots and organic matter intended to fuel growth, now only a couple of small piles of compost remain, and no exposed roots that also don't form runic workings. The mental backlog and idle thoughts slowly drift away, as I connect even more deeply with the roots. I reminisce of Pando, and the connection we shared, sometimes for days when I wanted to rest. I start to transmit my senses to Pando's seed. Nothing else is of concern, and in barely a blink of an eye, or so it seems to me, I'm called to action. Charlie arrives with a couple of the representatives in tow. Nash, it's your time to shine. Make them understand how futile it would be to try fighting against us. How overwhelming our advantage is. You just need to convince most of the soldiers on the opposing side that any fight on their part is futile and the contract should come into effect. Charlie says, Okay, I think I can do that. I pull as much mana as I can to me at nearly my maximum rate. Pando's seed does the same. 
Being more lavish than when we arrive, 200 mana goes into growing and moving roots in the network under the village. My next actions are visible to everyone. From our spot, roots make their appearance on the surface slowly creeping in. Eventually, they reach the defenses and start dismantling them. Bridges are formed over the low spots to allow our forces to cross with no impediment. I add a visual effect to the surrounding of my roots, and a glowing fog follows, obscuring most of the mass of roots, with only the first few meters of the roots remaining visible. My roots continue to slowly but methodically dismantle all the wire, blades, and wooden defenses intended to make any march to the walls an arduous task. I speed up the process by adding earth mana to shift the ground making it nearly smooth. Not everywhere, but in strategic places. Several wide paths are formed leading straight for the walls. Their mages try to stop this close to the wall and are minimally successful, but they can do nothing further out. My range may be virtually unlimited but even Merlin, the highest leveled mage I heard of, is limited to working with mana up to 100 meters away from himself. And that was double what the 10 next people on the list. I activate a few runes placed under the village. They're all on fully automated control structures. Everyone, entranced by the attack, barely notices as the walls crack and start to crumble in a few spots. The mages do their absolute best to stop it. They try to hold the pieces of the wall together, and on three of the four spots, they succeed. But one wide gap is enough. On the left flank, a less experienced group of magic users tries to fight me, but I simply overwhelm them. Soon a 10 meter wide gap is formed with nothing in between the field outside and the houses inside. They can do nothing to stop me. As the roots grow around the walls, I start to tangle distracted people. They spend all of their energy trying to futilely cut the roots and stop the spread. To finish it off, I activate the last of my runic workings. Something that will make it obvious they stand no real chance. They could hurt us, but even with the estimated 6,000 fighters inside, they would lose badly. Max's War Room. Inside Town Hall. Damn, I had hoped Nash was still recuperating in their village. I was surprised when I learned of his survival, but it wouldn't have been a significant problem if he had stayed outside of this fight. That was why they wanted this contract. With it in place, I will have no choice but to bow down. Whatever price they paid to Nash, it will be worth it. I observe an overview of the approaching routes moving the painstakingly built and expensive defenses surrounding my village. He has a flair for the dramatic. If I let him continue, they will win without a single casualty. I think about what I can do. The only thing that comes to mind is within my grasp, but the cost is too heavy to bear. A control that only I have access to. I place my hand atop it, and what before was on a screen, something external I could see becomes a fully immersive virtual reality experience. The walls start to crumble. I know that I need to take action right this instant, or I will lose. I can feel the power, something akin to mana just sitting there. It's not my power, just a gift from the system, and I shouldn't forget that. But it feels incredible. I need to do this. The cost is irrelevant. Having decided, I draw the entire energy pool stored in the war room. A mana battery the system supplied. The runes through my body, invisibly floating above the army channel all the mana in a single attack. The most powerful attack I can use. There are severe limitations in place, but for every villager under my control, I can add another mana point. So I use in a single attack the entire 18,000 mana available to me. Too bad I could only use my own mana. Even with the ways of transferring mana from the members of my army to myself, it was tiresome and time-consuming to fill all of it. And I can't trust anyone else with the war room, not even close. And there was also a long cooldown after using this finishing attack. A whole 24 hours. Something really good I gained early on and never had a reason to use. A reward for being the first in the instance to conquer another village. As the mana arrives from the control room to this, Avatar, I laugh. My imagination had nothing on this feeling. I was not actually up here, nor wielding my own power, but the rush is incredible. So I just watch as the thunder of the gods heads in Nash's direction. Even if I lose, it's fine at least he will be dead. A chill passes over me, and I instinctively know. If I don't act, I will die. Probably a lot of other people too but I can't concern myself too much with that. My entire ether pool leaves me again only days after a similar desperate gamble. I connect fully to Pando's seed in a way I never thought possible. Possibilities that did not occur to me before suddenly seem within grasp. The certainty that the ether brings is back, having been muted for the last few weeks. In an instant, I take a dozen different actions. Some like turning on all of the mana shields I engraved, with my roots require no continuous attention just flipping a switch. 
With the batteries baked within the very structure of the shield, they come into play at once and nearly instantly hit full strength. At the same time, I withdraw from the inner world the original protective cocoon I grew last time that I thought my life was in danger. It seems almost fitting for me to use it again now. It's not the same as last time. It now has an integrated mana shield that nearly instantly hits full strength. I activate the blinding formation I prepared for dramatic effect and concentrate on blinding anyone looking at us. Along with that, all the automated runic works I can think of start to receive mana. Disruptions, fog, and the elemental ones. The three meters wide cocoon of roots already around me about a half foot thick, folds upon itself forming a more compact, gapless, and better defended perimeter. The main shield covering the entire army, still weak given the low power it had been at, almost collapses as something hits it. A hole in the middle allows the attack to head straight for me. As the others close their eyes, squinting at the bright light and having barely moved back a step from my position, something akin to lightning hits the outer protective layer. This strange attack barely notices the second shield, burns through the roots, and manages to almost take down the third shield on the original coffin I modified. A moment later, the last of the shields, the one supposed to cover the entire army activates at full power. It can't close around the continuous though much weaker beam, so I take control of the formation and bend it to protect Charlie and the others from further harm. I try to move, but most of my roots are dead and blackened. I feed all the mana I can, hoping the last shield will win out against the remnants of this attack as the beam gets weaker and weaker. Though after a few more seconds it fades, I sigh and take a deep breath of soot. It must have been only ten or so seconds, but it felt much longer. After a moment, I stop feeling grateful for my life and start work to make sure that continues to be the case. I let go of the main shield, and it snaps back into place above all of us, except at full power and with no hole in the middle of it. I grow a thicker cocoon around me forming runes for the most powerful shield I can think of, connecting it directly to the battery in my inner world. I leave it active at full power, before continuing to grow a few other preparations. It may be overkill, but that single attack drained well over 5,000 mana from the mana shields in place, and in the very first second, and it burned through over a foot of solid matter. It was well beyond anything we have for artillery back in the village. It's mostly luck that I survived. A glance around tells me a couple of other people may not be so lucky. Just the refraction from the attack hitting me was enough to crisp all the exposed skin on the bodies of the closest people. I see Charlie and Sarah drag one of the worst injured away. A poor fellow in bad shape, and I can't help him right this instant. There are a couple of things to do, like making the main shield even stronger, further disorienting the enemy, and making them recognize the futility of their fight against me. That is the best I could do for everyone. Make sure not a single more person ends up injured. Chapter 82 As I calm down, my conscious mind becomes aware everything changed. The instant I thought I would die. The instant I hold the connection to my companion, and we became intertwined even more deeply. He seemed to share something similar to my perception field. Thinking of how things changed, the certainty that my first couple of uses of ether brought is back but as I cycle it I realize that it's gone again. And what my gut was talking about didn't have anything to do with ether. Perhaps I have just overused it a little, so I will stop for a while. A glance at my pool makes me wince at the amount missing. I hold only about 35% compared to right after integration. I come back to the perception field, and suddenly I know. This is how things have changed. Unbidden, the mental image that comes to mind as I attempt to look at the world with my perception field is of my own body of extending my body to encompass all around me. Space around me comes alive. The feedback is much greater than before. I don't have to rely on other tangential aspects to make out color. If before everything was black and white, now I had access to a true 3D colored vision with incredible resolution. I close my eyes and the mild headache afflicting me subsides. I think of a few experiments, but then remember where I am. So I continue focusing on defending against any further attacks. The main shield, a behemoth that nothing could get through, or so I thought before, now holds twice the mana needed to defend against an attack of this magnitude. I start to increase the throughput between it and the batteries in the inner world, but my main focus is on strengthening the double-layered shield around me. Protecting everyone else is fine and dandy, but increasing the defense the big shield provides by 10% takes much longer than tripling the strength of this smaller mana shield. Over the next few minutes, with the enemy still blind and confused I finish the preparations. And I turn my attention back to the enemy. I could probably be a small help to the medics, but I still focus on the enemy. 
The medics already have a few of the health fruits, potions, and an improved salve that the unnamed girl developed. After a closer look, all except a single one have more or less superficial wounds. With my focus back on the village, everything changes. Before, I could only move the roots so far away from myself because of my experience sharing Pando's senses. I inferred where people were from the vibrations and pressure as they stepped upon the roots. I am no longer blind. I move the roots as if the enemies were right in front of me. I can finally start tangling them quickly. I have yet to find any true poison, but a simple combination and concentrating the resulting liquid yields me a numbing salve that helps. Everyone caught suddenly starts to lose control of their limbs before they get completely tangled. I don't want to see you keeping your morale up. Charlie's POV. So doctor, do you think those two will make it? I ask in a low tone voice away from them. The system changed a lot. Back on earth, I would have given the big one a 10% chance and the other one a 50% chance of surviving. Now? The worse off one I give a 50-50 shot, and the other one should make it. The problem is that neither of them seems to have a particularly high constitution. Do absolutely everything you can. I mean, you should always do your best. But the consequences this time are direr if they die in our care, am I correct? Yes, I say simply thinking of the headache it would be if they died, for both myself and Nash. Most would not blame us for Max's actions, but a few people are waiting to pounce on any opportunity, and these two are amongst them. If their villages were anything like them, they will come with unreasonable demands and make us stink when they don't get it. A glance upwards shows me the shield activated at full power. At least nothing else should get through. The last attack was far too fast and sudden. Even a high-speed fireball would take 5 to 10 seconds to arrive at our camp even if we figured out how to overcome the range limitations. That lightning bolt, or whatever it was hit us in the blink of an eye. I have no idea how Nash managed to protect himself, let alone us. Max's POV. Damn that little bastard. I still have a trick or two up my sleeve. But even if takes him days, Nash is making it look like he could defeat our village by himself. Anyone with half a brain can realize it was not that simple. He would need far too much mana and eventually get tired. But the soldiers in the heat of combat aren't going to have the time to reflect. And he already had about 100 people tangled. It seems my persona which I was running 24-7, is now starting to affect my judgment. I calm myself and quickly run through the options. In a few seconds, my decision is obvious and I'm resolute. There is no other choice and delaying would only be to my disadvantage. I leave the control room and head for my throne room where the comm box is. Inside, my advisors and a few other people all stand around discussing the situation, but when they see me, conversation and movement stop. Nobody knows what my orders are and I only hold for a moment, to make clear that I'm the one in charge. My presence is all I need to silence a room. Before the silence turns uncomfortable, I start speaking. Turn on the calm. In a moment I'm connected, and Charlie's distinctive voice comes through. Charlie speaking. We yield. Everyone around me almost gasps in shock at my words, but they are well trained. No sound leaves their mouths, and before they can say anything I lower my hands indicating to the cut the transmission. My lord. One of my sycophants starts, but a simple glance sends him skittering back to his place. After another pause where not a single person makes a peep, I begin. Nobody here is stupid. I did not want to concede defeat. And if we push the issue, we may even have been able to inflict enough losses on them to make them retreat. But how many of our soldiers would be lost to accomplish that? A third? Half? I made the hard decision, and I did so early enough that the economic impact will be minimal. They are slightly surprised at my decision, but after thinking for a moment, they start to see the wisdom of my words. Some even seem to come around. I have cultivated an unpredictable persona for a reason. They learned I could head wise counsel, but when I reach my decision, even if it seemed random they know to obey me without question. The preparation was worth the time, as even the people who vehemently disagreed with my actions are meekly preparing themselves to obey, instead of questioning my judgment. Now invite them in. The contract is already in vigor. Station our soldiers outside and do what is required of U.S. In the contract, I managed to squeeze a few very obvious advantages if I yielded early, and it paid off. These were the easiest clauses for them to accept. They were probably counting on me holding to the last moment, not yielding so soon. The essence of my agreement limits my attacks on other villages. But I still get to keep my current villages as long as they wanted to be part of my coalition. And that wasn't a true surrender. The only thing I have to gripe about was the cost of freeing the prisoners, and the policing of anyone under me I will be required to do. 
so much preparation just to fail. If Nash wasn't acting as support, then things would be different, but that is fantasy land, and I have to deal with things as they are. Charlie and other village representatives enter Max's village. An hour later, not fully healed from the attack yet, I enter the village. To my side and around me are the 100 strongest fighters from all the allied villages. Not that we have much to worry about after the contract came into place, Max may play the brute but he isn't dumb. Even if the sanctions against him were mostly economic, he needs gold to make his little empire run just like everyone else. And he would lose any system mechanics like access to the map room and anything of the sort. He wouldn't even be able to initiate further contracts if he broke this one. That didn't mean we are being dumb about it. Around me and the other representatives are a dozen mages, a hundred fighters and roots accompanying us. With all of that, I'm not too worried about our safety. With all of our preparations and only a fraction of their army still inside the village, we should be safe. Everyone has mana shields and a few other protections, courtesy of Nash. As expected, the layout of the village is uniform with all of the others. We are guided to the biggest building in the village, the same one we turned into our guild hall. Though this one is much larger. We can faintly see where the scenes where their carpenters expanded it. When the second set of doors is opened we see the famous throne room. Finally, I understand why people talk about it. It feels like stepping up into an actual throne room. Given he surrendered, some of the luster faded. We all know he is not the one that holds the real power here. And as we step inside, the roots continue to follow us. A few more also move through the tiny cracks in the floor simultaneously showing up all around the room. Knowing that Nash can observe the place as well as if he was here himself is a relief. Taunting him to see his reaction, I ask. So you really yielded? What is it to you? He answers. Almost childish, though I couldn't forget most if not all of it was an act. Otherwise he wouldn't be in power. If that is how you want things to be. Let us get down to business. How are you going to pay the ransom for the people we captured? And so, another long negotiation starts. Max's POV. I was doubtful before, but now I see how he managed to wrangle over a dozen villages to come here so easily. Charlie is impressive, sharp and collected, with a tongue that even made me doubt my convictions for a moment. But looking him in the eye, I learn in that instant he has no idea of what I managed to sneak into the contract. He knows that I could ignore all the consequences and attack anyway, and he is prepared for that. What he is not prepared to respond to is me attacking without incurring the penalties imposed. There are a couple of loopholes, but today is not the day to use them. Their biggest mistake, in the end, was underestimating me. I wonder what they would look like if they learned of my previous occupation. A lawyer. Some would describe me as a sleazy lawyer, but I was just gifted. I had so much fun making contracts that screwed over the other side. I had always been big, but my back precluded me from imposing on other people like when I was younger. So I had learned to play the game from another angle. And I took to the profession with gusto. The system changed everything, and I didn't lose my knowledge and skills. I just gained another avenue to exert my will and when the time is right I will crush them all. Eventually, they leave. A single person is left behind in my throne room. Though the place feels hollow given the circumstances, that isn't of any comfort to him. You told me not to underestimate Nash. That is the only reason that I don't wring your neck. Yes. Shut up. You have a long way to go. I told you not to send the messenger bird during the day. I see he wants to speak, but he knows not to disobey me. I paid a lot for him. It wouldn't make sense to not get my money's worth. Killing him would be a momentary pleasure, crushing Nash and his village would be much more satisfying. He couldn't tell me anything confidential from the village. It is a shame, but I can't deal with it. I just needed him to hate Nash. That will make him a very useful tool. Chapter 83 Damn, I was hoping to see some fighting. This was boring. I hear a pair of soldiers talking to each other a few meters away. The entire camp was packing up preparing to leave. A few had already started running back to their villages. So you wanted the death and mayhem of a battle? Asks an older soldier. Probably 60 years old, though with the system in place his physical condition puts him on an even footing with the two younger soldiers. No, of course not, but I think that it's a mistake to rely on these system contracts. The levels we would have gained are just the bonus. Best case scenario, a couple hundred from our allied coalition would be buried here. Even a thousand wouldn't surprise me given the conditions. You shouldn't be so hasty on saying what is better not without considering the cost. But that guy with the plant magic already did most of the work for us. Hell, we might even have been able to force them out of the village, and they would have been lucky to cause more than a few broken bones. Well, either way, that is not what happened. 
so we won't find out either way. Now, do something useful and help me take this stake from the ground. Why do you want that useless thing? Just leave it there. You are, says the younger soldier who was silent to this moment. I let their voices drift away as I run the same math in my head. Unless we wish to remain here for days on end, we would need to attack. Even after my significant increase in capabilities, it was still too slow for me to be entangling enemies. They had nothing else distracting them. Even Merlin couldn't help. He didn't have the range. Something else they were not considering is that the longer I take, the greater the chance they would develop effective countermeasures against my nature magic. It is better to limit its use to a minimum for as long as I could. Though I have to admit, they had a point. Not sure I would choose the word anticlimactic, but something was missing. My awareness goes to the tendril extending back to the village. It's approaching 40 miles, almost connecting to the tendril in the spot we stopped at to sleep. Still, only a small part of the 260 miles voyage we made to get here. Luckily, I didn't need to spend longer on this. In the next weeks, even without any time growing them myself, I should see the connection become established. There is plenty of redundancy around, so it won't even be the worst feeling. The mood, in general, is a little brighter around me. Even if the battle maniacs didn't get what they wanted, something that had the potential to turn into an enormous threat for all the villages was cut down at the bud. Before I leave, however, I get a very intriguing offer from Sarah. So, do you want to come to our village? We saw what you did, and we want a few things like the runic structures that you can create from roots. We are not rich but I'm certain we can come up with a suitable payment arrangement. I agree. I'm certain they can come up with plenty of good ideas for payment. I would accept mana, coins, and goods. The main thing that I wish for is a better way to bring into life Pando's coin. Having another village start to recognize the coin would bring value to it. I don't know the metrics the system looked at to assign value, but it didn't hurt to try. As Sarah approaches, she tries to make contact with my roots. I'm still mostly covered by the roots, though this is a lighter construct that helps me stand and move around. Her movements, which I would guess were intended to sway me, end up feeling stiff and awkward. Is she actually flirting with me? Or is it something else? No matter, let's pay attention to more important stuff for the moment, like how I'm gonna go to her village. Something comes to mind then. Is the link between our villages up already? Probably not, but it should be close. Most of the seeds should already be in contact with their neighbors. I would only need to complete the circuit in a couple of intermittent spots. Onward to another village I go. Sarah's grandmother, matriarch of village. I stare at the child in front of me. Her age should already reflect someone mature. She should be married, but she was too headstrong for that. Her parents had all kinds of silly ideas in their heads. I failed with my useless daughter. I will not fail again. Without their interference and I have a chance to correct the mistakes of her upbringing. Your movements were awkward, child. I told you it would not be a good idea to try flirting with him. With a stiff posture like that, it almost seemed like you were petting a snake. With the roots around him, I couldn't do any better. Excuses, excuses, if it was me in my younger days. Yeah, yeah, but it's not. Either way, he is going to charge a fair price. We might even get a discount for being the first. You know very well that most other villages are quite reluctant to invite someone so powerful. Having a second village like ours will be good for his brand. Dot. You are correct, but if he was smitten with you, our benefits would be greater. He might even have done it for free. But it's no use crying over spilled milk. Get on with your task, child. I watch as she leaves the small tent set up for me. The time for our departure is almost up, and I leave as well. I make my way to the carriage we bought from Charlie's village. I could run back, even as old as I am, but it would be faster and far less tiring to ride on the carriage. Why can't the child see we are in the perfect position to attract Nash? With the situation as it is, we could easily become the second village in the instance with very little work. Representative of a village. I told you it would be worth it to join this expedition. Even considering the mana cost incurred. Hell, they could have charged us a gold coin. And it would still be worth it to have come. And mobilizing 100 fighters was much cheaper than that. We learned much more than we could have learned through spying or second-hand reports. Yeah. If Max had been more circumspect, he could have kept things us for much longer, and then he would have become a real threat. We also saw what trying to intimidate or bring overwhelming force against Charlie's village results in. Nash's capabilities are frightening. We didn't even get to see the other mages, though I'm told they are quite a bit less impressive, more in line with our own, perhaps a little stronger. Take that with a grain of salt. But either way, I already heard of a couple of villages almost thinking of hiring Nash like the matriarch's village. They are too trusting, 
but to each his own. Our alliance will eventually dominate all the villages in the instance. You know very well what the system's reward for that is. Neither of us knows, but we can guess. I'm almost certain that the Thunder Max used to attack was a result of his conquests. Perhaps it would be worth it to enter an agreement of our own with him. The limitations are too severe, I say shaking my head. He can be a defender for our alliance. His military power was minimally affected, and I doubt that many villages will want to leave his little band. I was also paying close attention to the contract. I'm certain he has a very good lawyer by his side, a passage or two from the contract was very cleverly worded. I look at my companion tilting my head slightly as he gives me a wide smile. After realizing why he didn't say anything in the meeting, I reply. So you knew all along, maybe even pushed gently for our side to accept the terms that he randomly threw in the middle of the contract because he is a dumb barbarian dot. I have no idea how everyone else didn't see through his charade. I'm just glad I did and managed to maneuver things in our favor. So do you want to stick around? Hell no. I will send a letter to him through one of the stealth classers we brought. Probably the assassin or the infiltrator. Being caught talking alone with him would paint us a very poor picture. We both grim and start to make our way back. Too bad we didn't bring enough copper or silver to snag one of the carriages that Charlie sold at the end of the campaign. We could have returned in style, but perhaps it's better this way. We have our own engravers at the capital of our little 14 village coalition, and they will make even better progress compared to Charlie's village. We just need to take care of one thing. We can never let one of our villages grow too strong. Let Charlie or someone else tank the system attacks while we were free to develop and reap the rewards. The 350 miles voyage back to our village has just started, and we have plenty of time to think and discuss all that happened and the next steps. But something is clear now. This guy is sneaky, very sneaky. I have to protect myself from any maneuvers he may make against me. As I start being carried on the carriage back to Sarah's village, finally, I can relax a little, so I open my system prompts. I felt something tugging at me during the attack. I don't know what it was, but perhaps, just perhaps I finally have a class suitable for me. I ignored everything else, as it would add very little to me, and run through all the options. Pando's vessel, uncommon. Plus 3% all stats plus 0.1 all stats per level. Plus 5% connection to Pando. There are have a few variations of this class, and I might even have chosen if I was desperate or there was one with a higher rarity, but I already chose a related subclass. True Earth Shaper, rare. Plus 3% to all stats plus 0.1 all stats per level. Plus 15% to intelligence plus 0.75 to intelligence per level. Nature Mage, rare. Plus 6% to all stats plus 0.2 all stats per level. Plus 5% connection to nature. Artificer, rare. Plus 10% to intelligence plus 0.5 to intelligence per level. Plus 3% to all stats plus 0.1 all stats per level. Plus 5% creation of artifices. Runic Enchanter. Rare. Plus 10% to intelligence plus 0.5 to intelligence per level. Plus 3% to all stats plus 0.1 all stats per level. Plus 5% creation of new runes. Creator. Legendary. Plus 12% to all stats plus 0.4 all stats per level. Plus 5% connection to your creations. Bonus have for creations of other people. Plus 5% success rate for creating. One with the world, scarce. Plus 5% to perception plus 0.25 to perception per level. Plus 3% to all stats plus 0.1 all stats per level. Plus 5% better perception of the world. There are dozens more available, but somehow I felt that more would become available if I focused on something for just a week or two, but I won't need them. The last two are the ones that draw my focus. They both pull me toward them. I preferred one, but they are both paths I would be happy with. So I open their detailed descriptions. Creator. Legendary. The holders of this class are people whose very life's purpose is to bring ideas to life. The class adapts to the holder and is considered one of the least limiting classes in the system, as long as the holder's goals are to create. From metal weapons to stunning works of art, from intricate engravings to the greatest speeches, nothing is beyond a creator. Plus 12% to all stats plus 0.4 all stats per level. Plus 5% connection to your creations, bonus have for creations of other people. Plus 5% success rate for creating. One with the world, scarce. A very rarely chosen class. A class for those that seek to know the world around them. For those not content with superficial knowledge. 
but whose very makeup is about understanding the nature of things. Plus 5% to perception plus 0.25 to intelligence per level. Plus 3% to all stats plus 0.1 all stats slash LV. Plus 5% deeper perception of the world. I look at the massive and perfectly allocated bonuses of the first class. The text speaks to a deep part of me, and I cannot take my eyes from it for minutes. It's perfect for me, and it isn't a combat class. It fitted me like a glove. I can spend the rest of my life bringing runic creations and new plants to life. I could bring anything that I desire into the world with enough time and effort. When I finally take my eyes off it, the same happens again. The second one also perfectly describes who I am. Worse yet, it seems to do an even better job than the first option. First, I had none. Now I have two amazing choices. I move back and forth while I think. The second one has a grand name. Instinctively, I know that even if I'm stuck at a low rarity for the first few levels, in the grand scheme of things, it's not much of a problem. Especially considering that it seems to be a class intended to grow with the user. Perhaps there are branches that I can take, but my gut tells me this class is intended to be started at a low rarity even if the eventual real class is extremely powerful. Only hours after my resolution to greatly diminish my ether use, I start cycling it again. I try learning anything else from the system through interfacing with my ether. I succeed, but soon the ether goes back to its place. It told me nothing my gut hadn't already about the classes. Developing trust in my instincts would be even better than taking a shortcut and using ether. Indecision grabs a hold of me as the carriage bumbles along forward through the rough track laid out. I can choose the better fit, even if the immediate bonuses aren't amazing, or something that I also yearn for, and grab all these extra stat points. The decision that I unconsciously delayed comes to me, and I need to choose now. I know that I won't rest I make it, not with such good choices. I won't step foot off this carriage before choosing, that is a promise. Do I choose a class that will bring me knowledge of the world? Or do I choose one that gives me the tools to change it? When I put it like that, it almost seems obvious, but I cannot get myself to take that road just yet. Yep, I'm not stepping foot outside before reaching a decision. Chapter 84 Days after the attack on Max's village, I wake up feeling fully refreshed. Different from the last few days, with no fear even before testing the waters, I just know I'm fully healed. The wound on my side is completely gone, and I spring from my root bed and run doing jumping jacks, cartwheels, and stretching in every imaginable way possible. I feel absolutely no pain, not even soreness from the lack of use of these muscles. They should be a little weaker than the rest of my body, but the sheer joy, the adrenaline hitting my veins overcomes it all. My recovery speed is miraculous, not quite at the level you would expect if this was a game, but much shorter than back on earth, something like this would probably mean a serious injury that may never heal. I look at my arms as my body starts to feel my own again not a vessel for the system or even my friend housed in the inner world. This sense of belonging within my own skin resonates very deeply with my choice of class. Finally, what had been missing fits into place, and I can suddenly see. I see more than ever before. But more importantly, I begin to understand, and that is the first step in any action. Each of my other senses comes to a screeching halt as the input of this new sense is all I can handle. The last couple of days were strange. I finally chose a class, and it fits me like a glove, but it strangely didn't give me a new class skill. So I knew something was missing, and now I found it. I can't just rely on levels or something else to progress with this class. I have to be comfortable within my skin. It seems strange the system has a requirement like this, but I ignore the peculiarity for the moment. I take the time to not only explore this new sense, but to relax as this familiarity is finally back. Ever since I was brought to this place, Things have just been changing at an accelerated pace, but this is a very good step into getting solid ground under my feet again. This perception field of mine, now even larger than before, somehow doesn't feel as if it's the goal. It looks to be just a consequence, that is probably why progress was so slow. I have yet to adopt the proper mental picture. Feeling throughout my body, it's clear what the goal was all along. Feeling like myself, owning my skin, or something along those lines. How that relates to this sense is still a mystery, but I can find out later. I began to master my own body, and so it has come to me. I idly check my system screen and spend a few moments working out how many stat points I have gained since my injury. The physical stats don't change much, only dexterity and perception increased a little. My mental stats increased by over 10 point in a few days. I'm starting to feel a bottleneck there, but that may be just the result of my stagnation. If I start to move around again, my brain will get further reorganized, and the bottleneck should disappear for a little while again. Finally, 
I tap on the class I selected. Different from last time, I don't get a prompt telling me I still don't meet all the requirements. It's a strange class. One with the world. Scarce. Main class LV. 10. Trial pending. Plus 5% to perception plus 0.25 to perception per level. Plus 3% to all stats plus 0.1 all stats per level. Plus 5% better perception of the world. My average stats is really starting to increase, but even after the system finally lets me press the button to accept the class, my level doesn't change. I take a little ether, a resource I have come to treat with much more respect, and interact with the system prompt. It is far from perfect, but after a minute or two, the impressions I get are distinct. I can somehow choose to accept this trial. After running my fingers over the text, I feel in my mind an option to take this trial. I laugh at the convoluted way I found out what this trial was about. I spent minutes carefully going over it with my ether, but the system has a button for me to press. I feel I'm not ready for it just yet. I'm close, but something tells me I'm quite there. So I move my fingers away and go back to amazing my stat screen. My mana pool is starting to get respectable. I still come short when compared to someone like Merlin, a high-level prodigy who chose to specialize. If I'm not mistaken, he must be close to reaching 2,000 mana points. Maybe more if he managed to get past level 50. I take a quick peek at my subclass. Nothing new is unlocked there. It seems I need to pass the trial for the main class to get the level 10 skill. Why my class is different is a mystery. I didn't even properly unlock it after I technically chose it, with that strange requirement not met. I want to see what all the buzz is about. I managed fine enough until now without one. Though I do have to admit, at higher levels, the difference between someone with a class that suits them and someone with a random class may be much more apparent. And if I didn't have one that suits me, I would cry. This trial business is new. I didn't hear of anyone else having to go through one. But perhaps it's because they chose more common classes. Not in the rarity is signed by the system to it, but in some hidden mechanic I guess governed them. It doesn't make sense to have such a grand name without something to back it up. Unless it's another trap of the system prompted by the council. Without waiting for another second, with these questions in mind, I open my book and flip through the last pages. It is starting to have quite a few pages filled out, but it seems to never have any fewer blank pages. I skim over a few of the new pages. It's useful information, but not what I want to know at the moment. On the very last page, as I read what these trials are about, I'm stunned. Some classes with high potential have these trials. I can only speculate what high potential means, but my imagination runs wild. Trials can be taken multiple times, but each time you take them you start to erode the very foundation of what makes the class special. I ponder for some time on whether to take the trial right now, but eventually decide to wait. There were a couple of things I wanted to do first. I may even be able to get some more information about it. I get up with my whole body tingling and a twitching leg. Legs with a familiar burn that I haven't felt since I came to know Pando. I can't stop myself, so I run trying to burn off the energy. I don't stop for anything not even to get a couple of things that I may need in my house. Whatever is in the inner world is what I will have at hand. I run around for a bit, but eventually, I realize I should choose a destination or at least a direction. Going north or south would just put me in contact with other villages. It wasn't bad per se, but not something I was in the mood for right now. I think about heading the east. I had heard from the scouts as they found the end of the instance. About 300 miles beyond the outer circle of villages was an invisible shield or something that stops any further progress. Some speculate that it can be broken, but I have a feeling there isn't any point in trying to go in that direction. We were somewhere created by the system, not in a real world. This only leaves a single choice, exploring the inner boundaries, about 300 miles inward of the smallest village ring. Heading to the east is the way to go. Whatever is in the high-level zone is the real prize, and soon enough I would manage to enter it. The line our scouts had begun to delineate is not some shield, but the territory of the beast living over there. We have grown used to the two zones. One that goes to roughly 30 miles from each of the villages. In it, only two low-level mobs reside, the rabbits and the wolves. Anything over 30 miles is the place where the higher-level mobs roam around. Both zones are easy enough to deal with. None of the mobs have the strategic thinking or magic needed to be a threat. Even when we were level zeros, with some knowledge we just kept our distance and used the terrain to our advantage. We heard of a few deaths from other villages, and most of them were from overconfident people. We had so far gotten lucky in this regard, and besides the one person going missing in the first couple of days, no one else disappeared, though we don't know what happened to him. Even slowly increase in levels, 
the mobs in the low-level zone haven't crossed level 20, and the medium-level zone still had mobs ranging from 50 to 70. The monsters in this new zone are a different thing altogether. All of them are over level 100 and heavily rely on skills, magic, instinct, and cunning to kill anyone who came into their territory. Charlie was thinking of sending a few stronger parties more prepared to delve inside the place, but the 600 miles trip put a damper on the idea for now. We only started getting accurate reports a few days ago. We still didn't understand much, and Charlie is taking his time. There was still much we don't know, and rushing would only mar our spotless record. I run straight to the closest spot in this new zone, without using even a smidge of mana, and the sense of exploration that was missing starts to come back in full swing. Passing over the last route line still connecting to the village and my house, I stop for a moment. Containing myself, I connect to the comm network and talk with a couple of people. I already send mana to the smithy and help forge one last pair of weapons, though I am still getting used to doing so far away, and one of the weapons almost fails to meet the plus 5 attack level. The minutes seem interminable as I talk to everyone and get everything in order. I could probably ignore it, but this way I won't feel any guilt if I wanted to extend my trip a little longer. Not that I know how long it will last. With nothing else in mind to take care of, I say my last goodbye and start running again. I go beyond the reach of the comms. It is much larger than after the attack on Max, and our scouts are spreading the seeds further and further. The beginnings of a massive network is starting to form, it has already cost me over a gold coin, and money continues to flow out as I wanted it as widespread as possible ASAP. The goal is to have everything in place without me having to manually send my mana and connect each and every single seed. Though a gold coin looked to be a lot just a few weeks ago, now it is the work of a couple of days with the smithy or on other villages. The villages that hired me to work on their defenses already started seeing some of the benefits. As the routes grew and eventually connect to the main network, they will begin to see the full array of improvements. I have plenty of money coming in through multiple avenues with a few of my low-effort ideas coming to fruition from the MRI, and I carried a couple of loads of, or for the village. Even all that doesn't compare to the stream of mana. I have more of it than I know what to do with. The hours tick by, and I slow down. Even with my prodigious stamina, the fruits I ate for the regeneration, and even the attention to vigor, the tank is beginning to empty. To speed up the recovery, I start to tap into my mana. Now running at about 40 kilometers an hour is no longer hard. I even increase the pace to about 50 with the plentiful supply of mana I have. I can't wait to see the edge of explored space, going where no man has gone before on a five-year journey. Chapter 85 I stand over half a mile away from the beast. It stalks in my direction until it comes just short of the invisible line that separates the zones and then it simply stops there. As I walk back and forth, it moves to accompany me without stepping foot out of its habitat. Its entire focus on me is unnerving as it stands at guard without coming a single inch forward. I approach step by step until I'm only 15 paces away. This is just inside the range of my perception field. I don't trust that this beast will remain on the other side and that is why there are thousands of roots protecting me. From far away, they appear limited to knee height, but they are coiled and can spring an instant several meters high. I'm also completely covered with the strongest root armor I managed to make and a fully powered mana shield. That wasn't even counting the other shield and a few other tricks up my sleeve hidden in the formations underground. I am as prepared as I can be in the short term, so if it wanted to attack me at least I would be hard to chew and maybe give it indigestion. Analyzing it, the system informs me nothing besides its level the very level disparity that was the likely culprit. Black Panther, level 106. Not even the useless description it normally adds is present here. The Black Panther calmly sits there. In its eyes I see intelligence that even Aster, the oldest of bunnies in my inner world, with all her progress would be hard-pressed to match. We continue with the staring contest as I use my perception field to on it, or rather him, whatever you prefer to call it. There are no visible scars or injuries in his body, and his claws easily pierce the ground. Each of S muscles is relaxed, but somehow I know he is ready to attack in an instant, it wouldn't even need a tenth of a second of preparation. A thin sheath of fur covers its skin, and if the feedback I get from the field is even half accurate, it is one of the strongest materials I ever felt or saw. This is the first time I have run into a monster that is not warped, and it is even scarier than the ugliest mutt running around in between villages. Well, the first is not warped excluding the rabbits or the monsters from the system's attacks on the village. 
Why this new class of mobs is trying to bite our heads off is still a mystery, but perhaps I will find clues when I enter its territory. My roots slowly grow on the other side of the line. Besides the immediate surroundings of this panther, I don't spread my roots around focusing on extending my range inward. Occasionally, I open a small portal to my inner world to allow one of the bigger seeds near the path I'm growing the roots so they can spread and form a net instead of disconnected tendrils. I take a quick look at the contraption in the inner world. It isn't anything too complicated, a swinging armor release mechanism and runes to power it, but it is quite useful in its simplicity. It has been tested a couple of dozen times, and I don't notice any wear and tear or anything outside the norm. Blackwood's work lives up to the reputation even on something like this. This contraption also gave me a better idea of what he can do and how well he can work metal. The very first time a seed is flung out of my inner world faster than any human, even with the system's help can throw an object. I notice a reaction from the panther. Not with my eyes. Even considering the significant benefits from my class on the perception stat, the movement is not visible. I only notice it with my perception field. A slight tightening of the muscles, but in an instant, it relaxes and as I shot again and again, even focusing my perception field on the beast doesn't reveal anything. The only movement from the panther is his breathing. Surprisingly, the 10-foot long and 5-foot high creature breathes even slower than me almost looks like he is meditating as he breathes in once every minute or so. But the beast being meditating is absurd, right? I sit on the ground and begin growing a quick formation underneath me. In a few minutes, a dome man a shield stronger than anything a suit of armor could hold comes to life, and with another layer of protection around me, I let my muscles relax. With everything in place to delay any attack long enough for me to run away, I can imitate this beautiful creature, but before I start meditating, I increase the pace of the planting contraption to once every second. Over the next few minutes, the pitching machine shoots a thousand of the apple-sized seeds. I only stop when the entire space, a one-mile diameter circle around me, is filled with the seeds. Technically, I didn't need to also include anything behind me, but I have plenty of seeds and I only stop because I can't reach beyond the half-mile limit using these seeds. Even with the dimples and the shape to improve the aerodynamics, I was already at the limit. Their density and strength put a limit to how far I could shoot them without making the shells larger. As I start meditating, I slowly but surely connect every single one of the seeds and over the next half an hour the mesh forms as I end up with full coverage. I use my perception to look over the entire place, every single square inch. I go back and forth but nothing stands out about the place. Perhaps if I expanded further inside, but I don't want to remain here for so long. With no point in remaining, I say goodbye to the panther and am on my way. I distance myself from the boundary, leaving behind a bright red line. A visible and clearly delineated limit for the next people around. I don't want anyone getting chomped for an honest mistake about where the line stood. With the vast collection of new plants and my experiments, it is easy to change the color of the roots and branches to a bright, almost neon red. Unexpectedly, a couple of interesting plants start to show up, but I don't spend too long experimenting with them. Just collect one or two shrubs of each and send them to the inner world. As the miles accumulate, I spend a few minutes here and there accelerating the growth of my persimmon facsimiles with fractions of a mana point at a time. I could use a lot of mana to speed the process a lot, but I had done that for only a couple of them. I keep running north along the invisible line, though I'm very careful. If I enter the territory without noticing, I may stop noticing things altogether, permanently. The panther, like a few of the subsequent mobs I encounter, followed me for a minute or so but stayed behind when it became clear I was moving away from their territory. The one thing I don't understand, as smart as they are, why don't they try to lure me inside the limit by pretending the line is further in if they are so eager to chomp down on us? Could it be some system limitation? I let the question go as I concentrate on the ground, the trees rushing past and where the high-level zone starts not to accidentally enter it. Occasionally, I take from my inner world another contraption, the runic compass though that is not a very good name for it, I respect the inventor by using it. Moving a bronze pointer overlapping the pair of needles in the palm-sized device, I calibrate where the high-level zone diving line is, and the black needle tells me precisely where it's safe to head which I follow always paying attention to my right as I follow further north. I occasionally run into beasts when I stop to calibrate the compass and I am not shy about planting seeds, sending mana, and preparing the place for warning lines to grow in the days and weeks to come. Specially modified seeds with the same bright red coloration I planted in the vicinity of the Black Panther will tell anyone precisely where it's safe to move. 
Now, most of the time, I just run in a slightly curved line planting seeds along the way in three parallel lines. One where I run as near to the diving line as I dare and one to each side at about 200 meters away. The throwing machine is working with the big seeds as fast as it can, swinging from side to side and firing as I plant several of the apple-sized seeds in the middle. As I continue, I start to notice a slight shifting in the climate and foliage. Only someone who understands the forest could notice the subtle difference. Luckily, I am one of them, though I'm not sure how useful the information is. Is the extreme north colder than where we are? Is the vegetation there different? And about the south, would it be colder or hotter than the equator? As questions begin to fill my head and the thrill of the exploration sends my heart racing, something that was missing is finally in place, and all is well in the world. After over a day goes by, I give in to my protesting legs and need for sleep and finally stop. Setting up a little hut takes me less than 10 minutes including growing a small formation with a mana shield to surround me and a little hut. Letting the tiredness take me deep into sleep, I just imagine the refreshing feeling and how much further I will be able to go when I wake tomorrow. Springing out of the comfortable bed I made, I take inventory of what my buddy has done. I connect with him in the roots of the hut I made yesterday before sending my awareness through the tendril growing back. You are getting much better at this. The warm feeling I receive in return is so pure and innocent, it could only come from someone like Pando or him. We need a name for you, don't we? I can't just keep calling you Pando Seed. What do you think of calling you? Pando 2, or just the second, or better yet, Junior? As I speak, I try to transmit the best translation of each of those names. Being able to broaden my communication with him to something close to what I had with Pando has been a blessing. He understands much more and will slowly be able to help me with even more. I don't get a positive response to any of the names. He is fine with me calling him Pando Seed, but if I want to change it, I need a better option, not something worse. But even as I stop, the distressed feeling transmitted through our bond only grows. Fine. I won't call you that. Don't worry. It's fine. Everything is fine. Pando's seed. Pando's seed. Talking to him, especially given how young he is, is a different experience. His cognitive functions grow at an astounding rate, but his emotional growth will take a little longer. The smallest of things can set him off. The only thing I can do is to reassure him and try to avoid the same mistake in the future. I focus on what my senses tell me of his growth and how he went about it. He is focusing much more on the way the roots spread with the help of the seed, maximizing distance first and leaving strength and mass for later. For the four hours I was asleep he must have continued with a fairly thin stream of mana withdrawn from the inner world battery and I can feel the impressive results. A glance at the nodes of the network he has set up and a look at the smaller stockpile of seed sends me laughing. He started using the seed somehow. With him able to control my inner world, he has the potential to bring tremendous harm, but I trust him, so it doesn't bother me. I don't know how he used the seeds, but I doubted it was with the help of the pitching machine, and now I know what to teach him today. In a few minutes, after stretching and eating a few persimmons, I'm on my way. Behind me, I leave a mile-wide disc of roots that will greatly accelerate the growth in this region in the months, maybe years to come. The tendril going back the way I came extends nearly a hundred miles. Very impressive for a being lacking the system's help handling the mana and too little time had passed for the seeds to fully grow. But even then, if I let the endeavor of spreading to infinity in his hands, he still would do an amazing job. This is my little friend. I say standing a little taller. Keep it up. I continue to run north. The long process of explaining how the machine works begin. Maybe I could even teach him how to build one on his own. Now wouldn't that be wonderful? My thoughts eventually turn to his big brother back on Earth and how he is faring. I hope things are going well over there. Nah, I don't have to worry. Pando can manage for a little while longer on his own. Even if I stick around for a year, he is much older than that. He will do just fine without the short-lived friend he just acquired. Pando's POV. The time of the attack arrives again. I have learned a lot in the last attacks, especially from the strange metal implement from the one that tried to take control of me. The mana he wielded is very useful, but I still failed to make full use of it. It was much harder to control. So I concentrated on the strange shapes and carved them on the roots underground and in the bark of many of my limbs. It was a slow and time-consuming process, with several limitations placed by the system itself. Strange word, system. I had some access to it, but incomplete. The small beings needed much less mana to achieve the same effect, about a dozen times less mana for the same effect even after all my improvements. The difference had to be related to the system. With the help of these symbols and shapes, I am slowly making some headway. 
One of the most useful runes I found can store mana for later in my lamps. So I started to grow massive reservoirs of mana, though they are only massive when compared to the mana the little creatures wield. When compared to my reserves, it was a modest increase, though the mana batteries grew by the day. I have yet to see any of the ELFs after their initial foray, but somehow I know they are out there watching me. All those thoughts are filed away the instant something changes in the periphery of my domain. An organized group comes in, much larger than usual, and I wade as more and more head in and start to circle the grove. I use the one skill the system gave me and identify them. Among the mass of useless or incomprehensible information, I find their names. At S, Ogre, hashtag dollar hashtag end. Asterisk percent three dollar four at. Shamans, asterisk end. All around about 500 shamans of various types and about 15,000 ogres. The largest attack to date. Except for this time, there are no weak enemies to pad the numbers, and I know this will be much more difficult than in previous attacks. They enter the edge of my domain and start circling, burning or chopping off each of the saplings there. They march over the ashes as fast as their shamans can burn. Anger fills me at their actions, but I can do nothing to stop them so far away from any of my real defenses. When the ogres brush against one of my limbs not too badly burnt, I release some spores. They slowly accumulate on their skin and armor. Hopefully, enough will enter their bloodstream. When the time is right, I will send the signal for the spores to release the agent inside them simultaneously. I didn't use much nature mana because of its limitations, but in this instance, it is very useful in connecting to the spores. So long as they stand in my domain, I would be able to control them. They continue this for hours. Not a single new enemy arrives, but only a few of them are caught by surprise or distracted enough that the defenders of the grove manage to finish them off. Hundreds of thousands of saplings later, when they are starting on the second round around the grove with trees a few months older, they finally step on another of my surprises. Something much greater than a few spores. Making full use of the runes, I wield the mana much more effectively. At my signal, the defenders of the grove head in. My roots underground start defending against the fire in earnest, while also sending destructive magic amid the enemy. As I activate the spores and all the enemies affected, over a thousand drop to their knees. Poison hits their veins, enough that they can't even stand. Another thousand start having trouble standing, so I take the opportunity to finish them off, though most of the focus goes to the other type of enemy, the shamans. With thousands of strong animals heading in and my help, most of the magic wielders fall in the initial confrontation. When there are only a few left, the ogres start to lose their cohesion, and most of them head roughly for the middle of the grove. That just makes things easier with the more concentrated defenses. But it's the few that concern me. The ones reading out of the forest. I can't do anything about that, so I stop worrying and focus on the enemies heading deeper into my territory. Close to 50 shamans and nearly a thousand ogres. Fire and lightning, roots moving with strength and speed until not a single one of them stand. Safe for the moment, concern comes back to gnaw at me. This is the second time in an attack where the attacking force retreats. Only a few this time, but I have a feeling that this is not a good sign. I know far too little about how things work. Concentrating on what I can affect, I move all the roots around the grove and start to drag the few living remainings of my saplings and the dead ones back in place. The living ones, I can integrate back. It would be faster than growing them from scratch. The dead ones will be food for the soil and make the next generation grow faster. This is the natural cycle. What is not natural is how frequent they became, and this time far too many of the youngest fell. Five out of every hundred trees became ashes and some of those enemies are still out there somewhere, possibly waiting to cause even more destruction. Not being able to even tangentially observe anything outside my domain is a very big limitation. The defenders are much smarter and more organized than before, but they still did not remotely approach what I have started to grow into. Lessons Nash tried to teach me for years suddenly started to make sense, even stuff I thought I couldn't remember. Each time I exercised my mind or limbs, I noticed a very small but noticeable increase in my capabilities. I need to find out more about these new enemies. An idea comes to mind. I send a thread of nature mana to the farthest reaches of my domain into a tree outside of it. At first, I fail, but I'm nothing if not relentless and hundreds of attempts later I succeed. My roots integrate into this other tree and although there is something different, I notice that my domain grows and I can sense all those who stand near this tree. Ideas come to my mind. I could be much, much larger in a relatively short time if I could do this continually. I may even be able to see enemies before they enter my domain. The excitement rides to a halt as a couple of questions come to mind. 
How do they know the edge of my domain? Does my perception have something to do with it? Should I expand my domain or explore this before doing so? Yes, both explore and find better ways to grow much, much larger and stronger. If the enemy can stop playing by the rules, why can't I do the same? I have finally begun to develop a way to counter their advantages, and I'm going to take advantage of it. To grow. To learn. To understand. To survive. Chapter 86 As I head further and further north, I start to push my luck a little. With already grown and charged formations for mana shields and fireballs hidden away in my inner world, I'm as prepared as possible in the short term, so I dare to enter the high-level territory as I run north. Each time I enter, it's almost as if a magical trap is activated and in a minute or two some beast comes bearing down on me. I can usually move back before they make their way to me, but when that is not possible I rely on a lot of mana, slowing formations and shields to give me the time as I face the level 100 plus enemies trying to eat my face. None of my creations can hope to stand against even the weakest of the beasts for more than a few moments, but they last long enough for me to cross the line and get to safety. I just have to avoid moving farther in and my safety is all but guaranteed. I think about trying to dig tunnels or heading in on a wooden tank similar to our carriages, but with strong mana shields and whatever defensive measures I can conjure, and I will probably do something like that in the future. But a single glancing scratch from one of these beasts is enough to instantly break a mana shield with about 500 mana. Even the strongest tank I could make would only last a few seconds. It would probably be another story if I made the tank from mithril or something, but I seriously doubted even deep steel would be enough to keep me safe. I continue flirting with the danger of dismemberment, or worse, to help me level skills like analyze and learn more about the opponents on the other side of the line. So I continue to enter the space that is denied to us all a little further each time as I get used to how the beasts react and create further runic designs to help me. Underground, I start creating a network of roots, which they don't seem to notice, so I don't bother to come up with anything fancy. Occasionally, I shoot a few of the bigger seeds close to each other and further in the high-level zone, with the intuit to start small concentrated. It feels wrong to just uniformly spread the roots all around and never let them form a growth. When everything is connected, at least the outer half-mile would be visible to me through Pando's seed perception field. Very similar to my own, though much greater in range for obvious reasons while also more limited in detail. Two days later, and a good 2,400 kilometers north, I feel as if I should turn back. I still want to keep in contact with the village. Before turning around, I catch a fallen branch. In the colder climate, these trees develop differently, not in species, but keeping the same variety, the trees change the shape of their leaves. These are thin and pointy, not quite like pine, but close. A simple adaptation that allows them to thrive in the colder climate, though I notice little difference in how much sunlight each day. Yet another sign of the system's interference in this created place. I look up at the sun. By the distance and position I calculate only another two or three days to reach the quarter turn point around the high level zone. The very place I expect to find the coldest climate. Next time, I could try to go the full round but it's time to head back. Without stopping to enter the high level zone, adjusting the runic compass, or even stopping to really catch my breath, the run through the charted path is a little faster. I head to the spot I met the Black Panther, the roots underground will be a little more developed there, and I can contact the village. I push against the ground with greater strength than all but a few sprinters could sustain for more than a few seconds back on Earth. With my slowly but surely increasing stats and skill levels fueled by the ether surrounding me, I feel as the tasks become easier, but my maximum speed has hit a bottleneck. Not something insurmountable, but the very physics of the situation demanded these limits. Drag, the cube law, energy, and the formulas ruling their relations swim lazily in my mind. I could calculate exactly how many jowls of energy I spin with each step, but I don't need to for now. Maybe if we were back on Earth where those kinds of measurements would be useful, maybe even in the future as our runic technology reaches the point where those small differences become the only place where to seek further improvements. But for now all I needed to know is that beyond my current tremendously fast speed of 50 kilometers an hour each extra kilometers per hour would be hard fought. If all energy for running was directed to overcome the wind, a 26% increase in speed would double the actual energy expenditure. I am not quite at the point wind was the only consideration, but even my fastest sprint didn't reach 80 km per hour an hour, but at 48 km per hour I could go on for days. Quite a contrast to back on Earth where my sprint was over three times faster than my ultramarathon pace and the wind was only a minor consideration, almost a rounding error. 
I ignore the numbers that slowly crept into my head and focus fully on running. Intermittently, I cycle my ether as I change my running form. Even my katas take a back seat as I feel that my current activity is giving me plenty of progress stat-wise as it was. The resource infusion I take to heart, and my full focus goes to it every so often as I try everything under the sun to improve its effects on my body, if only slightly. Vigor and stamina slowly fall and raise as my rhythm varies and I recharge each of them. I fall into an almost hypnotic state as I make my way back only to realize I'm back at the clearing with no conscious memory of the last two days. I almost keep going, but the bright red line to my left takes me out of my kinetic meditation session. Reaching into the recesses of my mind, I can only remember about the first 12 hours, but I just shrug. It's not a bad thing. A little tired, but strangely not overwhelmingly so. I sit down and connect to the root system. So focused I was. I didn't even try to connect with the network in the last couple kilometers where the seeds were a little more developed. I pull a comm from the inner world and reach as far as I can trying to link the tendril reaching for the village with some part of the network before laying back just to rest my eyes for a second as the tendril grows. One connection, two connections, three connections. Hours later, I feel the stiffness in my joints and a cramp as sounds are blaring in my ears. Cracking my eyes open, I groggy reply. What? Nash, is that you? Asked a vaguely familiar voice, and after a moment as my brain catches up, I awake properly. Oh, sorry. Was sleeping. Yeah, it's me. The connection must have been completed while I was catching a few ZZZs. It's fine. Is everything okay over there? For that matter, where are you? The closest border to the higher level zone. I made a little hut over here so I can get a nap. I didn't know you were expanding the network in that direction quite so soon. That is quite far away. I just finished it. Took me a while, but it's worth it. Are you trying to level there? That is dangerous. Even Greg doesn't joke around with those level 100 plus beasts. Nah, just exploring. But that is not why I called. Give me the updates about the village. I say anxious to know how things have developed. We are fine. I listen as he updates me. Most things have developed as I expected with the main reason for my return still three days away. That meant I could remain around here for a while longer before helping with the attack. After a good 10 minutes he finishes, so I ask to be transferred to the MRI and wait until I hear Burge's distinct voice. Nash, is that you? Yeep. How have things been going in my absence in the Institute? Fine, we managed to make a few advances I'm certain you will appreciate. Yeah, like what? Remember the flying bicycle you asked us to create? With my heart suddenly in my hands, I tentatively answer. Yes, that was the pipe dream. But to be honest, I take a flying dung beetle. You don't have to settle for anything. Now mind you, the rune we used is maybe mana efficient, but it limits the height of flight to about three times the length of the vehicle. So a two-meter craft can only hover to about six meters high. We got a couple of people who were studying aerospatial engineering, and they have been an enormous help. I'm glad. Now tell me more about it. I say rubbing my hands as I finish working out the kinks from my sleeping position. We tried to make a normal plane but the system somehow recognizes what we are trying to do and interferes every time. Even kites don't fly like they should, but we managed to get around it by using a rune that creates a magical ground effect field. Could you tell me how you made it? Maybe I can create one of them without having to come back to the village. I can do better than that. We finally fixed some of the kinks in data and image transmission. If you can make a simple runic working, we can connect our visual senses so you can see all the changes we made. Over the next few minutes, we work in concert to make the synth sharing rune formation, finally rid of the crippling headaches and dizziness it used to induce. Making it with my roots is as easy as ever and the connection is established smoothly. I piggyback on Burgess's vision able to see everything around the institute. As he sits at the table, he ruffles through papers and slowly shows me the runes they have made over the last few days. Plenty of them are the small changes you expect from better understanding certain formations providing small upgrades but they finally have figured out something else I am very much interested in, and I ask about it. So, now we can show visual data through the connection? Yeah, we still haven't figured out the other side of the equation. How to compress a picture so it will be able to be used as a security camera. But it works wonders for visualizing something stored in one of the memory cells you came up with. I left more of them in the village, a small cache of those memory cells tucked away in my hut. You can pick them up later, I will leave the door open. Damn, you can do that from so far away? It won't be pleasant, but I'm pretty sure I can. I say as my stomach flips at the mere thought. Shaking it off, I continue. So come on, get to the bicycle already. Okay. 
I mean, we call it that, but it can be in any shape we want. The MIT students helped make it aerodynamic, but you can grow a monstrosity if you want to. Now, pay attention. He continues to tease me, slow rolling the presentation, though he doesn't add anything superfluous, just choosing the order to delay the actual presentation of the schematic, but finally he unrolls the largest sheet on the table. In front of me is a wonderful sight, a four feet wide page filled with runes that will take me hours to work through, but I don't need to meticulously analyze each rune to recognize how they manage to achieve the ground effect. In the center, a few slightly larger runes, similar to the ones used on the carriages to inflate their tires, grabs most of the mana output and cycles it, forming some kind of resonance. It looks as if the runes uses the mass of the ground to repel itself. So, did you figure out how it works? He says with what I imagine is a big grin. Yeah, you cause a resonance with the central runes and uses the mass of the ground as a feedback mechanism to return a similar field, sustaining the craft in the air. I'm pretty sure it doesn't even need something as solid like the ground working on water and maybe even the tops of trees. Crossing my fingers, I hear a groan from him and a loud snort from someone else in the lab. As he turns around, I hear one of the new researchers speaking to him. Told you, he would get how it works in moments. Well, it seems you were more brilliant than I expected. I reply with a laugh before speaking. Well, I was guessing as much as anything. It's the only thing that made sense. I will still need hours or days to be able to deconstruct the entire thing and understand how it works. Sure, but it is still very impressive. All that only from a glance. Sure, it isn't a perfect match to electronics, but I always had a way of seeing a schematic and in a few moments getting it. How it works, and how to fix, and what was broken just screamed at me. But, I thought you lived on Pando, and was all peace with the tress, and what not. Yeah, that too, but I had to make money somehow, an hour of my time here, or there was plenty for me. If you want I can help fill in some of the major parts of how this works. Sure, go ahead. He continues speaking, but seeing something through the corner of his eye reminds me of an idle thought I had and the possibilities before me open a whole world. No, a whole universe. Burgess, I interrupt him. Let's see if I can read that book on the hand of the new researcher. Oh, yeah, almost forgot about that. Before your little heart explodes, yes, you can read the books from a distance. I watch as he takes the book and leaf through it, and finally the beginning of another of my plans is starting to come together in my mind. I spend the next hour getting the details of how our library would start, it was already in motion, but I expanded the scope to encompass other villages and much more data than most people would expect. With access to the data storage and the books from the village, the two villages who were fully connected to us would be able to rent a reading of our books without having to buy it themselves. They could pay with mana, system, or pandos coins. All my batteries were already bursting with mana but I am always adding to my collection along with the ones under a couple of other villages, the massive one under my home, and the ones in the village. Even this place would be getting one in a few moments. I don't have to worry about running out any time soon. Maybe I will be the one giving mana to the village, and not the other way around. I close the connection, as I start to grow a four-meter-long flying bicycle. Though I use the term loosely given it doesn't even have a single wheel. I grow a fairing in the specific dimensions and shape provided on the blueprints to reduce the aerodynamic drag as much as possible. I may have plenty of mana, but no sense in wasting it. They still haven't tested the vehicle extensively, so now I know exactly what I will be doing just as soon as I finish my preparations. I start moving the battery from my inner world to this place. Earth and nature mana are as expected very useful now, though I still retain enough of the battery in the inner world to continue my mana expenditure. From the ground, I draw some of the roots already grown previously to refill the inner world and speed up the process of making a battery. Now there is another place that mana can pool. The path to the village is still fairly narrow, so only 1.5 mana per second can flow from there. But in the days and weeks to come that will slowly increase. It is not the first time I have done this, and the whole endeavor was starting to become routine. Though, with a few of the developments on the other side of the coin, Perhaps I will soon no longer be the biggest mana battery manufacturer. Stuart and Merlin are working on a promising lead that would allow for runes to be cast. If we joined forces, the sky would be the limit. Imagine leveraging my inner world and other capabilities to make giant runic structures. I leave all of this for later and start on the last of my immediate tasks. In the last few days, I have grown a different kind of seed, which is as heavy as a watermelon, though longer and thinner, about a palm wide and half a meter long. With the contraption to shoot it, 
I start at about a mile from my spot and slowly but surely extend the tendril perpendicular to the line dividing until I'm pretty sure I have reached the limit. If I'm correct, the maximum range is around 15 kilometers. Even if they can't connect, I will have some root islands already in place when I eventually extend tendrils further in the high-level zone. I don't know if we will be able to make our track further inside anytime soon, but the beasts don't seem to bother with the roots, so I make full use of the loophole. And in the next weeks, I may have access to something much deeper into their territory than our strength would normally allow. My plans run through my head, but in a moment, I discard all of them. Leaving the test of the flying craft for later may be the mathematically way correct way of accelerating my growth, but I can't wait another moment. I mean, come on, it's a flying craft. That flies through the sky. Even if it was limited in height, I would be soaring amongst the clouds at a hundred miles an hour. I look up, but all I see is the blue. Not a single cloud up there. No color variation. Well, but even if there were clouds, the craft couldn't reach that high. I finish the last touches, climb on board it, and start to pour my mana into it. Like a helium balloon, I begin rising and very slowly drifting with nothing to stop my movement but the very air. I rise 8, 9, 10 meters high before reducing the flow of mana to the runic formation responsible for lift and start to pour mana into the propulsive one. Just a tenth of a mana point each second into the second one and lazily the craft starts to move. I grab the steering handle in front of me to align the profile of the craft with the direction I'm going. As I gain speed, dodging around the trees, I climb higher rising 10 meters above the treetops slowly gaining speed as I increase the mana to the propulsion unit. Let's see how fast can you go. I head south wondering if it will be hotter. How would the trees there change? Perhaps I could make a little foray inside the high level zone with this craft. There was just so much I could do before heading back to the village. Small goblin settlement. I squint my eyes as I see something in the sky, something moving fast. A brownish dot approaching me, fast, very fast. Worried I start backing away. It couldn't be heading in my direction, could it? Perhaps I should increase my pace. I turn and start running. Each look back. I see the dot is closer. Not only closer, but heading straight for me. No, no, no. I don't want to die. A frantic scramble ensues as I do my absolute best. Damn short legs, I can't run fast enough, too many obstacles in the forest. The very moment I think will be my last, I hear a thump to my left. Looking over there, I feel mana emanating from some 30 meters away. Stepping lightly, trying not to make any unnecessary noises, I creep closer to the overturned ground. Closer, I see a hole in the ground and confirm this is the place the mana is coming from. I think of digging it from the ground where it burrowed itself, but that seems wrong. I resist the impulse to lay on the ground. I'm not a shaman, just an apprentice, and if someone caught me worshipping something without a shaman confirming it came from the spirits, I would get into a lot of trouble. I pat the dirt and leaves off my coverings and start running back to the village. I have to tell the elders about this. It fell from the sky, so there has to be some meaning to it. Chapter 87 My heart thumps in my chest as I go faster than ever before. Ten mana per second enters the runes, and I'm propelled at unbelievable speeds. The trees rush by so fast they seem like a fuzzy green carpet. I make sweeping wide turns, given my speed, while trying to avoid any spots much lower or higher than the treetops. Suddenly dropping a few meters is not much of a problem, but every time I dropped in height on a clearing or something, I had to slow down a lot to climb again safely. I look at the makeshift speedometer, not a precise way of measuring speed without bothering to precisely set control distances and clocks, but the best approximation puts me at roughly 200 kilometers an hour. This is nearing the hard speed cap. Even 30 mana a second didn't break 210 to 220 kilometers an hour. Back on Earth, I never moved this fast. I never needed to fly on a plane or travel on a maglev train. Even if I had, this is something else altogether. Flying close to the ground on such a small vehicle is closer to speeding on a motorcycle than anything else. But eventually, not yet tired of the rush, I turn back. I could have gone for days on end riding the high, but after clearing my head I know my course of action. With about a mana point every second, I zip by at 150 km per hour. Even without stupid amounts of mana, I can still triple my previous travel speed and for that I am grateful. No, not just grateful, I am ecstatic. The feeling that my bicycle gave me so long ago was back, and it is like nothing else. Even on Panda with so much else to do, I still hadn't retired my two wheels. The sheer joy of approaching a new place on my own power knowing little to nothing about it was amazing. 
As the night ends, I return to the hastily constructed hut right in front of where I ran into the Black Panther. I open the system screen and focus my eyes on a few words. Trial pending. Perhaps it would be better to wait a little longer before heading in. But I can't. I have already spent too long stuck at LV. 10. It is time to make good use of the mountain of EXP sitting there and used. My fingers twitch just as I touch the button. Each beat of my heart sends pressure throughout my body. I feel all my body tingling. What will happen? From one blink of an eye to the next, I'm standing elsewhere. I feel a little funny. Turning off the perception field, I realize why. There is a similar skill active that I turn off. A look around tells me I'm standing in some kind of ruin right out of a movie. A small chamber with a single corridor to leave. Everywhere I look is covered in rough stone, even the small dome on the roof of the chamber. I turn this new skill from the system on again, if I'm not mistaken it is the skill I should have gotten with my class. After ruffling through my stat screen, I find it. Perception Field. Level 1. Provides an omnidirectional sense of all that is around the user. Skill level determines range and resolution. Distance, 1M. I stand there for a few moments trying to get used to the skill. It takes me way longer than it should. The feeling is very similar to the skill I have developed by myself but the range is very low, and I can barely tell the ground is rough with it. Far less information than I am used to receiving. I try to look in my inner world with it, but I'm left disappointed. The skill can't even perceive that I have an inner world. After another minute of trying to get used to it, I turn on my normal perception field. After fiddling a little with it, I manage to exclude the volume of the lesser skill gifted to me by the system. Now I will be able to both level the skill and still have the benefit from the range of my original skill. Prepared. I open the system prompts and look at the last one. You have entered a class trial. The trial will begin when you leave the chamber. All senses except the perception field will be severely muted. All skills are locked except the perception field. You are to explore the space around you. A score will be assigned for your performance on the trial. If you fail, you will have to wait 30 days before retrying. Each attempt reduces the potential of the class. You will lose all progress made while inside the trial. A prompt will show up in case the user's life is in danger or you wishes to forfeit the attempt. I stare at the words, but after a few moments I shrug. I focus my full attention on the outside, but nothing useful returns to me. So I follow the single choice and start walking. As soon as my feet touch the corridor I feel a wrenching sensation and suddenly I am at a loss. I look for Pando's seed, but he is gone. A few roots are still spread out throughout my body, but nothing else remains. The inner world is out of reach. I try to use some mana, but it's like my fingers are buttered and I'm trying to catch a fish. No even harder than that, like I'm trying to catch the very air. Nothing is as it's supposed to be. Frantically, I try my best to connect with the inner world again, even drawing my ether to see if it can help. After a moment, I faintly feel Pando's seed in the inner world moving away. Tears come unbidden out of my eyes and I can't even feel as they drop. Muted my sense of touch has become. After a minute of fruitless efforts doing my best to reach out to all that was taken from me, I get up and wipe my eyes. Now is not the time. I'm not unfeeling, but something drives me and all that is not for the purpose of finishing this trial is set aside. I extend my arm out and with all my strength close my hand. I can't hear or feel popping my joints must have made, but I can imagine it. I will succeed. The system seemed fit to take everything from me during this trial for some reason. That was its first mistake. Within me, I try to grasp my resources. First step. Fail to grasp mana. Second step. Fail to grasp stamina. Third step. Fail to grasp health. Fourth step forward. I find resistance but succeed in grasping vigor. This cycle continues as I start to map out everything around me. It wasn't nice, but after a little time thinking, something good may come out of it. Even with a few minutes here and there focused on vigor, I spent too little time improving my control of it. The system made stamina so much more convenient to use, but relying on these resources is a mistake I will not repeat. I will not spend stamina as long as vigor is an option. Looking at the heath and mana pools within me, I decide to take control of those resources by myself so nobody will be able to take them from me. Vigor and stamina are very similar, and when one is depleted the other follows well at an equivalent rate, but I was much more used to vigor. So I hold this thought in mind much more easily given there is nothing to distract me. Soon I come to the first choice in my path. Another corridor and the question burns in my mind. Do I turn right or continue going straight? Even with the greater range and feedback, the original perception field doesn't tell me anything about what is ahead, so I pick left and continue running. 
It only takes me another two turns to basically confirm a theory about where I was. This place is a maze, a three-dimensional maze that spans a good area and I was supposed to map, like a labyrinth designed to confuse even the smartest people. I have a good memory but not that good so I retrace my steps and find the initial chamber. Using ether as I have done thousands of times before the system, I connect with the thin roots spread out in my body. They show no intelligence at all so I have to painstakingly move each of them myself. It's strange and it takes me time, much longer than I wished, but the effort will pay off. A strange map begins to form. Kilometers of roots within my body begin to be shaped following the turns and elevation changes all around me. A new organ starts to push to in my abdomen, the only place where the three-dimensional wide map wouldn't interfere too much with my other organs. Luckily, ether seems unaffected and I still could affect the remaining roots spread out in my body. Without them, I doubted I would fare well in this trial. Unsteady on my feet given the reduced proprioception I am under, I continue to run up and down always turning to the right unexplored corridor on intersections. There is no day or night, though even the little light there was in the beginning soon fades or my sight does. I can't tell which but I'm fairly sure more than 24 hours have passed. I continue to map the place and strange as it may seem. I'm glad. It was painful losing any contact with Pando's seed, but it feels as if my body is my own again. I had had intermittently felt like this in the last week, but this is different. This wasn't just a moment or an epiphany, so I began to follow my kadas again. The ether around me follows lazy and slow in its natural cycle as I continue to feed it with a thin stream from my internal stores. I find another dead end. I'm almost turning around when I notice something different. A difference in texture in a piece of the wall I almost missed. My normal perception field, now at 5 meters, can't perceive it yet. So turning it off I approach using only my natural ability. Minutes pass as I slowly trace each of the lines in my mind. It vaguely looks to be an engraving, but if it is... I can't recognize a single rune nor the rules for how they intertwine. I only have a limited amount of roots within me, so I won't be able to store things indefinitely, but something tells me this is important and I make a copy separate from the map of the place. Finishing up, I turn around and start to make my way back to the closest intersection with some yet unmapped corridor. As I put one foot in front of the other in the perpetual motion of falling and catching myself, also known as running, the symbols don't leave my head. There must be some meaning to them. They look like runes, but I can't use mana in this place, so even if they're it won't be immediately useful. Could they be a puzzle or a language? Those are the only choices that make sense to me. Plenty of other things cross my mind, like them being works of art, but I dismiss all of these ideas as soon as they show up. Twelve hours later I run into another of the scribbles in a dead end. I stop and start to compare it to the copy I have within me. They look very similar, but after about ten minutes, I'm certain of my conclusions. They are not the same. Sure, a superficial glance may make them appear copies of each other, but there are quadrants shifted. If I split it into nine pieces, one is half an inch to the left, the other half an inch higher. Yes, I think I get it. It's too complex to remember the whole thing without a copy or a photographic memory, but I just need to store the changes, the positions they have been shifted to. As I'm about to leave, I sense something liquid in the other wall. Approaching, I touch the wall feeling, even through a very muted and fading sense of touch how fast my body heat is sucked away. Water. I found water. At least one of my immediate needs is taken care of. Turning off the system skill, I focus only on the more familiar version of the perception field. At about five feet from the ground, water comes out straight from the wall, as you may find on a natural formation. Behind it, however, there is nothing. No mana, no runic formations, no reservoir, no feeling of magic. It just sprouts out of thin air. Too thirsty to care about that for more than an instant, I put my mouth against the wall and start licking the spot trying to get as much water as possible. It is frustrating letting so much of the precious liquid fall away, so I try using my hands, arms, and even my shirt but nothing works. Finally, I manage to form a seal with my lips around it and without separating myself from the wall, slowly gulp down the water accumulating in my mouth. I spend the next 20 minutes there attached to the fountain of life until I'm full. In an hour or so my body should have absorbed it all, and I would be able to continue drinking. I think of waiting and resting a while, but I just keep going. I can always come back. Running to the next part of the exploration, I feel my stomach grumbling, but I ignore it. They could have made my hunger magically disappear for this trial if they were taking everything I was carrying with me, but it's not the end of the world. Just a little hunger. As I continue, finding these puzzles becomes more and more routine in between my jogging bouts. 
The days pass and the thin covering of fat on my body starts to change. My skin turns gaunt and almost unnatural. I have always been thin, but this is something else. I stop at regular intervals to sleep for what I guess to be about two hours. Otherwise, I keep going far beyond what I have ever pushed myself to in the previous world. I know that lack of food isn't something that I would die from while I still have any skin covering my bones, but this was way beyond what I had done in the past. On the sixth day, what I see before me is very different. Even before I approach, the opening doesn't come to a sharp stop, but a big chamber emerges in my perception field. I halt and approach it slowly. Even as I enter it, I cannot sense the other side or the selling, and if the slight curvature of the wall behind is any indication, the chamber is at least 50 or 60 meters wide. I run along the circular wall, trying to map the chamber. Every 10 meters or so there is another door. I pass 17 other doors before I come back to the one I arrive through. Carved in the walls between each of the doors is something very similar to what I found on those dead ends. I turn off the skill-based perception field to concentrate on their shape. A close look reveals a near copy of the puzzles I found. Curious, I creep along until I'm touching it. This one, however, seems different somehow, not just the raised frame of rock giving a distinct feel. I touch the middle with my finger and the barest of brushes shifts a small piece slightly. One of nine pieces and I finally understand what this is supposed to be and what I'm supposed to do. I choose one of the puzzles I found and start moving the squares to the sides, up or down to match one of them. When I'm finished, I think of what could be wrong, but I try the next puzzle I found and another and another until, finally, something happens. Behind me, I feel a tremor through the ground with my perception field, seen as I no longer can even feel pain with my skin. Turning around, I walk to the middle of the chamber. Each step is slower than the last, but I don't stop for an instant. The faint senses muted to the point of uselessness start to come back as I make my way and even my vision comes back. What greets me is so wonderful I don't have words to express. I ignore the chamber around, the design and the stone in the middle of the chamber, focusing only on what sits in the middle of the stone table. A piece of bread. Chapter 88. I stuff my mouth with the most delicious piece of brick, sinking my teeth in it as if my life depends on it, because it does. My jaw hurts from trying to separate the pieces for me to swallow, but before I notice I have finished it all. With a little more of my faculties back, I look around. I'm still hungry, but I shouldn't eat any more for at least a couple of hours. Not after so long on an empty stomach. Do the same rules of physiology still apply after the system's interference? I could feel within myself that some changes were taking place that shouldn't be possible on a biochemical level if we limited ourselves to the periodic table. The system bridged a lot of gaps and threw a lot of rules out of the window. Identifying the result of my body gaining new capabilities and what was the interference from the system, the resources, ether, or a change to my body was hard. I am still inexperienced in the ways of the system, but I will learn in time. Hell, half the reason I chose this class was because of my desire to learn. Creating was nice and all, but I lacked knowledge of the system the most and any chance of acquiring more is critical. I have a feeling that this class may even be a more suitable class for me long term, though what form it will take at higher levels is still unknown. With my stomach filled for the moment, I make use of my returned senses and behold the huge room. Rough yellowish stone like the place I arrived here, but with a much higher ceiling, a dome 30 meters high. I take in the sights guessing that my senses will fade when I leave this place. I make use of the time before my next meal. Too tired to continue for the moment, I start meditating. Within me, everything is still as out of reach as in the moments after I left the first chamber. The only thing that returned are my senses. Miffed but not letting go of the opportunity, I continue trying to extend my understanding of vigor and eventually the equivalent of health and mana. They have been stubborn, and the dulled proprioception while running in the maze didn't help matters as well, but I was making progress, oh so slowly, but progress nonetheless. But I have a feeling that this place was uniquely suited for learning about those resources. Perhaps it's not the goal of the trial, but even if I didn't succeed on the first try, I can still improve, slowly chipping away at the challenge. Ether begins to spin around me. This time, I don't forcefully attribute anything to it. Even doing it this way, following the natural flows of my ether, I'm left with the same if not a stronger feeling compared to the first time I used ether. Successfully detoxed from the rough handling of ether my first attempts have been, I only nudge it slightly. The certainty that filled me the first couple of times I used my ether is absent which is probably a good thing. Nothing good could come from constantly being in a state of surety about everything. I need to grow, learn, adapt. 
look for how to improve. If I had all the answers already, I would have already accomplished all I desire before lunch. I relish in the discovery, in the struggle, in the progress, in the feeling of achievement that investing my time on something brings. For years I have just gone about my business over the days and weeks without thinking about it much. I was proud of what I had done, but I also settled on the course with little forethought about the results, without looking at it to see if I could do it better. My shortcomings seem painfully obvious now, even considering that I was less experienced back then. I breathe in again and let go of the frustration trying to creep in. It is a lesson and the best I can hope for is to learn from it and not repeat it in the future. I run over what I know of this labyrinth. Looking at the map I started to form, a close glance shows me something I hadn't expected. There is a pattern to it. If I assume that the roughly circular shape forming delineates the limits and that I won't have to deal with more than the three levels I have discovered till now, the corridors meandering through the empty space on the map cover about 70% of the volume. So I have explored roughly a third of the place. A closer look at the map also makes it obvious now that there must be something at the center. Though in the last few days I heavily tended to the outside of the circle. It looks pretty clear to me that there must be something at the center. Though I didn't waste any time. I managed to push through the lack of food further than virtually anyone else could. I have yet to start losing much muscle mass, and I know that as long as I still have some fat it will continue to be the case. My exertions start to catch up with me, so I lay back just for a moment for a quick nap, and the world is no more. I open my eyes, feeling a knot in my shoulder. Damn, I fell asleep in a very awkward position. Next time I will plan it better. Still with no clock, and the only source of light now the constant faint glow above me, I get up and stretch for a few minutes to get rid of the soreness that accumulated from the night of sleep. Though the pain is more reflex than real damage to my body. The immense stat pool the system helped me attain is doing wonders. Expecting to get six more loaves of bread, one for each of the other puzzles I found, I go around unlocking so I can get something to eat. After the third unlock, I stop and head back to the table to eat the two loaves. As I expected, my senses are muted again as soon as I leave the central formation. Except this time, every single sense is completely gone. Well, no great loss there considering how muted they were. Even the control over vigor seems to be slightly affected, but it should be good practice, right? I eat a hearty breakfast to replenish myself. After so long without food, the sight of food alone was enough to send my stomach all over the place, like a washing machine with a very unbalanced load. I could hold out a while longer, but so close to the stuff of life, inches away from nourishment, my body reacted like a ravenous beast and I eat both of the round loaves of bread I unlocked. Each about the size of my palm, they probably had about the number of calories I spend in a day with light activity. If I'm correct in my assumptions, there were 18 in total. Rationing one per day, I still have 15 days left. And so I spend the next few days. I explore every single inch of the place over 12 more days. With a greater understanding of the logic of the maze and some forethought, I cover more ground with less overlap in my trips around the place. I continue putting one foot in front of the other as my new senses perfectly match the size of my inner world and stop there. I couldn't confirm it for obvious reasons, but I knew it in my gut that would match perfectly down to the millimeter. No idea why, but it must have something to do with my mental image about the proprioception of my body and the domain around me. Perhaps there is more to this inner world than I first thought. I go back to the center, and finally, unlock the last of the pieces of bread. Like all others, it just waits for me in the middle of the table. It may be teleported there for all I know. Three loaves of bread left. As I sit, I look over them and I change my plans. I split them in half and slowly eat one of the pieces. It is bland, sure, but I couldn't care less. I not only want to complete this trial, but I want to do well and if I didn't manage to achieve the maximum result, whatever that was, perhaps I could gain something else from it. My fine control over vigor was improving, and I was making progress even with the muted feeling the very environment is trying to impose on me. For the briefest of moments, I can use it like stamina and infuse my body as I do with mana with the power that fills me nothing to joke about. The health and mana equivalents are still elusive, but there is something there. I'm sure of it. I am not clear on how useful it will be, but I left that question to the wayside and continue eating. Wiping my mouth after finishing my meal, I sit and start to meditate. I wish to continue my work to unlock the other two resources, but I still feel there was a deeper level to the current puzzles. Simple math dictates that with a couple of images and an understanding of the logic behind them you could do this by trial and error and unlock all 18 puzzles. But if that was all, it seemed too easy. 
An hour goes by with thought after thought coming and fading as I run through the possibilities in my head. I don't find anything new by going over the current information, so the next step is to go gather more. Running through the entire labyrinth again is obviously out of the picture, so I have to concentrate my efforts on specific places. The obvious choices are this chamber, the initial room, and the 36 places where I found the symbols on the walls. Half of them are copies of each other, something I only discovered at the 11th site, it being a copy of the third. They could however be ever so slightly different from each other, and I simply didn't notice the difference or I missed something else. Already in one of the places I decide needs a closer look, I start. I walk to the edge and start circling it. One step, stop and switch between both my perception fields, just in case. So far the only difference between them I that the one not gifted by the system is a lot better. Not in size, as they are the same now, but in another very important aspect, how sharp the image is, or what the smallest detail I can make out is. Reflexively, I put my hand on my forehead. The dull and faint headache I was expecting to find myself with is gone. It has slowly faded over the days as I trained here, but it is completely gone. Good riddance. Running the perception field is very useful, but focusing too hard on it for long periods was painful. With each step, I look behind the walls, above the ceiling and under the ground, but all I sense is solid stone, like I was in the middle of a mountain or deep underground. I've put my body against the wall and lay on the floor to get another few inches of range, but neither action brings any new information. If I had access to my book I'm certain I would be able to achieve more or at least do it faster. Shaking my head, I take another step. I go over every inch of the mechanism behind the puzzle on the wall, the corridors. I search everything exhaustively and nothing stands out to me. So I start to make my way to the center. It was the obvious place to find anything. I sit in the middle and start to go over every inch, with an even closer look if compared to my spin around the chamber. The table. A smooth and thick stone sitting atop a three-foot by two-foot cylinder in an imposing if simple image. My eyes can't see anything outside the ordinary, and a vague look with the perception field also doesn't reveal anything new but a deep focus scan reveals small internal discrepancies. Inside of it, I notice a slight difference in texture, something I didn't notice on the first day before my improvements in the resolution of my sense, but I do so now, and after knowing it was there I cannot ignore it. There is no difference in density of the material, the only thing different is the flavor. Maybe the color is different, but I wouldn't know without breaking the table, which sounds like a bad idea. I try to trace it along with the table, but I fail miserably for a few minutes. Instead of continuing to bang my head against a wall, I start to run to the initial room. Now at least I have an idea and all I need to eventually succeed was training. Perhaps I will even learn how the food teleportation runes works and cheese the system. Now, wouldn't that just be peachy? A mental image of the next attack on the village comes to me, but I put it off. It's starting to take too long, but Merlin is there and he can control the roots well enough. This is important. I didn't hear of anyone else getting one of these trials, so I must make the most of it. Chapter 89 Running back to the initial room at the edge of the map, I start my meticulous search through it, paying special attention to the interior of all the stones to see if I can find any that is even slightly different. But no runes or anything or the sort stand out to me. That is not a surprise. I did this room first just to eliminate it from the list. The next step is where I'm more likely to find what I'm looking for, but it will also be much more time consuming. Even if each of the dead ends is smaller, they are also spread throughout the maze and I will be running from one to the next in the shortest path to avoid wasting any time, but it will still take me a good 20 minutes between each. On the first and second one, I find nothing. No differences in the symbols on the walls, no hidden runes, nothing that screams something is different. When I arrive at the third place, instead of going through the motions and repeating what I did in the last attempts, I begin my search from the place the corridor branches out. Over 150 meters of meticulously hugging the walls and crawling on the floor later I arrive at the end still without finding anything. Could it be that the difference was in the very symbols I have already found? I have already gone through the main chamber puzzles, but perhaps I will find something I missed the first time in here. With that thought in mind, I sit right in front of the puzzle and start lightly meditating while holding the piece in front of me in full mental focus. I ignore all that is not the symbols in front of me and trace each line anew with the slowly growing network of roots within me. I use most of the roots that can reach the spot on my left lung, and a long sheet becomes the map for it. The most precise and accurate copy I can make. There are no small indentations, different symbols, or anything of the sort that I suddenly notice. 
The only thing I can't check is the dimensions. I place my arm against the symbols in the wall to carefully and painstakingly measure the distance of several points as references in the most precise way possible. I dedicate my full focus for the next couple of minutes to my perception field and meticulously move the roots inside my arms to be able to compare sizes. I run to the next place on the list as fast as I can, and after the 15-minute sprint, head straight for the puzzle. I mentally superimpose the foot and a half image in front of me with the 6 inches new copy in my body and place my arm against the wall at several angles as I compare the measurements from the other puzzle. At first, all I notice is the very same that I did last time. The nine quadrants that form the puzzle are shifted a quarter inch to the sides in different directions. The only difference is in the connecting lines between each of the quadrants, but they shift in exact proportions and angles to match the placement. I take a step back and look at the entire thing. The differing angles on the connecting lines. If it was possible to use them, I could calculate the placements with more precision, but the puzzles in the central chamber don't work like that. So I will have to do it the hard way by just comparing the distances between a few spots. I ignore the copy of the entire puzzle and put my arm against the wall again. The dozens of roots are superimposed against the wall, even if my senses don't work like that, so they can act as a ruler. The difference in distances is very subtle. I thought there were only four options, left, right, up, or down. But within this simplistic answer, I see the distance is not uniform. Each of the pieces is shifted from 7 16 to 9 16 of an inch from the middle of their area. This is why the puzzles allow you to put the piece anywhere within a cross. I pushed each of them to the very end each time, but perhaps there was a second level and this looks to be it. I mark everything of note and go back to the central chamber. I head for the third puzzle and start to shift each of the pieces. I do so with as much precision as I can, barely tapping them until they are perfectly in place. I do this for both the third and fourth puzzle, one in each arm, but nothing happens. No tremor, no mana, no change in the puzzles, and walking over to the middle of the chamber also doesn't reveal anything new. No bread, other items, or hidden compartments there. There is absolutely nothing that will help me, but that doesn't discourage me. I'm certain of my conclusions, and this just means the eventual prize will be all the sweeter if I have to succeed in the entirety for the system to acknowledge it. Running to each of the 16 other places in pairs, this time only quickly looking for hidden runes. I start to measure the distances as precisely as I can. Too bad I don't have a caliper, and even if I could grow one, the environment around me presents a strange quality similar to the void I passed through before arriving in the instance and any part of the roots outside my body slowly disintegrates. So I just focus on growing the shape slowly within my body and make use of every single tool in my box to the best of my ability without lamenting for what I don't have. This time it takes less than a day to complete the circuit as I head straight for the puzzles. Even as more and more puzzle pieces are precisely put into place in the central chamber, nothing new happens. After going to all 18 of the puzzles, I walk to the middle of the chamber without knowing what changes await me. Still uncertain about what is wrong or what I have missed, I sit to meditate. A light meditation focusing only on the table with something inside ignoring all else in my perception field. I can make out a very light, almost imperceptible improvement over the last time. I guess working with the puzzles is good training. After resting for a few minutes, I go back to each of the places where I found the puzzles and continue improving my perception field. My stomach grumbles and any doubt about this being a dream is gone. It has been a while since I have gone this deep in meditation. I worked the last couple of weeks nonstop. I get up and start stretching as my mind turns to the problem at hand. A look at the interior of the table starts to reveal more detail, but not enough to draw the symbols, but it is an improvement nonetheless. So after eating another half loaf of bread, I depart again for the first of puzzles, measure the distances in almost a ritualistic stance, trying to minimize any factors that may interfere and introduce errors in the measurement process and return. I do so redundantly, with equal measurements in each arm trying to match the angles of each line as a second way to measure the distance, though the differences of the static places and the pieces on the central chamber make the endeavor hard. In the central chamber, and with an even lighter touch, I move the pieces of the corresponding puzzles back and forth until I have them sitting in the exact place I want. Hours, days, weeks pass as I measured one puzzle in each arm, while occasionally using redundancy and measuring a single puzzle with both arms. At times I don't know if I'm improving or just moving things randomly back and forth, but I don't let doubt detract from my attempts. At the end of another day, after the 18th and last puzzle of the day, nothing happens, again. Big surprise. I guess I know what I will be doing tomorrow, 
and the day after, and the day after, until I succeed. At nights I focus on improving my perception field, not only its resolution, but also how to judge distance, angles, and other small details. During the day as I run back and forth, I practice with my vigor and can almost taste the mana and health tantalizingly out of reach, but I continue as if it was the very first day. The first week following this new routine. I don't know if I'm making any progress, but comparing myself now with the me from when this routine started, I know that at least the perception field was slowly sharpening, and that must mean each day the puzzle pieces are more precisely put into place. I will eventually succeed. Long after I eat the last of my bread, I finish the last of the puzzles for the day. Looking at it, something in my gut tells me I got it wrong and instead of stopping and leaving it for the next day, I head back this very instant. Running to the corridor where the match for the last puzzle is, I measure with both my arms everything, not that it should make much of a difference and in minutes I'm back in front of the last puzzle again. I tap and tap at the stone pieces with the lightest brush as possible when the whole thing solidifies. It just turns into a solid piece of stone similar to the puzzles engraved in the walls throughout the maze. Even the connecting lines are now perfectly placed, and without moving a single step, I reach out and feel to each of my sides for the stone puzzles there to find the same as happened to both of them. A rumble starts to build from the middle of the chamber, stronger than when I first unlocked the first of the pieces of bread. My vision and other senses slowly come back to me, though I still can't feel mana and the other resources, just like what happens in the middle of the chamber. Looking over, I see a blue glowing crystal floating above the table with the distinct shade of blue from the system screens. It has been a while, but someone can never forget that tone of blue. I walk over and extend my arm to touch it, but stop myself just short. Till it send me out of here if I do touch it? Probably. I was so close to drawing the runes on the table. Maybe I could stay for just a few minutes? And I stay, though minutes was just the way to convince myself not to rush back. The village must be missing me by now, and I will probably have to empty my pockets the moment I leave this place to pay for my stay on the instance, but it's no matter. A couple more days is not going to make that much of a difference. Figuring out how this table works, or just being able to properly look at the runes is worth the delay. So I sit one last time, and this time I won't get up while I don't succeed in something else. Automaton? System Administrator. What has that boy been doing? He was on a class trial, but he is taking much longer than usual. Trials are a little rare, and there are benefits to taking one while in the instance, but is he purposefully delaying his return? Perhaps, it's no use speculating too much. Let's just wait for our next meeting. He is bound to surprise me either way. Maybe he will even tell me what class he chose. I could come up with a nice gift for him in repayment for the information. I can't be anything extravagant. Otherwise, the system will interfere, but maybe, let me see what I can scrounge together. Even if it takes me a while, it will be worth it. Chapter 90. Just one more rune. This is all that is missing for me, and in a few minutes I will be done. A horizontal line, a curved one connecting it to the next one, two crossings, and... There, that is it. I'm done. Finally done. I spring to my feet ready to leave. Now all I need to do is touch the blue floating crystal. I hope. As my fingers brush against it, the distinct blue screen shows its face again. Class trial, one with the world. Time, 43 days, 12 hours, 16 minutes, 16 seconds. One days, 5 hours, 18 minutes, 4 seconds instance time. Congratulations, you have passed your class trial. Passing scores. Two puzzles unlocked. Class loses one rarity ranking. Five puzzles unlocked. Class maintains rarity ranking. 18 puzzles unlocked. Class increases one rarity ranking. Full puzzle unlock. Chance to try the next tier trial. Why are there two times? Instance time. Is the instance a type of accelerated space chamber? The very opposite of a hyperbolic time chamber? If I'm understanding things correctly, I don't have to worry about the village. I still have two days. Even if I take the next trial, I still have a good chance of arriving on time. I try to pull up any other screens from the system, but it is an illusion. The system is not back just the screen, and as I find out seconds later after dismissing it, one more. Do you wish to exit or move to the next trial? Note, player protections on the life of the system user will be lifted. Join at your own risk. Exit next trial. I look at the thin skin covering the bones in my hand. So translucent I can almost make out the bones underneath. I don't have much more leeway. Should I be more careful? Who am I kidding? Of course, I'm going to take it. I can't leave the option on the table and forever regret it. I click the next trial button and in a flash, I'm outside, right where I started all of this. What? 
I chose next trial. I even used my hand instead of relying on the mental command. What happened? Everything is back in place. My connection with Pando's seed, the system's resources, and everything I think to check, except I'm not where I was expecting to appear. I'm laying in my tiny hut protected from the environment on the same spot as when I entered the trial. I open the system prompts intent on looking for answers. The other messages will wait for later as I quickly flip through looking for answers. In a few minutes, I can contact the village and get them to tell me how long has passed. That was something at least. A glance outward confirms it's night. Counting the time spent on the system's clock at the trial finish, I should have come out around noon. So some time has passed and I have no memory of it. Without some type of clock in my interface, I have no way of knowing how much time I lost without contacting the village or someone else. I extend my hand and look down. I'm almost back to normal. My 170 pounds frame is back to about 160 to 165 instead of the very gaunt 130 at the end of the first trial. I close it into a fist and feel not only is my full strength back, but that I'm even stronger than before. Walking outside and with a jump in the air, I confirm my expectations. Higher strength, agility, and dexterity stats. I look for the most distant tree I can make out and notice how much more detail I see. Increased perception. I fight off the desire to run around and try out my new capabilities. They should have had a modest but significant improvement. As I flip to the next system prompt, I grind to a halt. Tier 2 challenge, fail, all memories locked. What? So the system really messed with my memories? No, I won't allow that. It can't just blank out parts of me. I'm the only one that can change my memories. I will get them back if it's the last thing I do. My memories are mine. I look through my memories probing them, but things are firmly locked down. I remember simply showing up here. I take a deep breath and continue going over the relevant messages. One with the world. Rare. Main class LV. 50. Incomplete tier 2 trial. Plus 5% to perception plus 0.25 to perception slash LV. Plus 4.5% to all stats plus 0.15 to all stats slash LV. Plus 5% better perception of the world. At least it did what it was supposed to do. A rare class. If I do well on the next trial, I might be able to increase the rarity again. Though from how hard it was just this single first layer, I should probably prepare more instead of diving in again half-cocked. I already failed the second trial and I wouldn't want to waste the chance again. Curious about the size my inner world has grown to? I open it and stare in amazement. Inner world. 0.9 asterisk 99 asterisk 41 asterisk 50 slash 1000 equals. 100 m diameter Kate. 53, 7% efficiency. What? That is not fair. I do some quick mental calculations and I arrive at over 180 meters in diameter. I focus on the word capped, then efficiency, trying to see if the system will give any more information, but nothing happens. I look through several menus, but no matter what I try, no new information is available. Letting the matter rest for a little while, I think over my skill list. It is also caped, as the system puts it, at level 99. I will need to figure out what is happening there. But that can come later. I spend a few more minutes thinking and going back and forth through the system screens, but nothing of note shows up. I click on expand the class menu and a few choices show up, chief amongst them. You have met the requirements to unlock a secondary subclass. Creator. Uncommon. 50% effectiveness. Plus 1.5% to all stats plus 0.05 all stats slash LV. Plus 2.5% connection to your creations. Bonus have for creations of other people. That, I definitely want this subclass. I didn't even have this in mind when I chose my class. Nobody else has unlocked another secondary class. Are they unlocked at all the transitions, like levels 10, 50, and 100? I attempt to feel all around me with my perception field and more information than I ever dreamed of floods my mind. I instantly let go as I fall to the ground holding my head as I spend a minute massaging away the sharp pain in my skull. All the while, I can't hold back a grin. I need to be more careful, but for an instant, I felt everything within a 50-meter radius. The hut behind me, the roots underneath, the other side of the imaginary line separating the high-level zone from the medium-level one. For a slip second, I felt more than ever before, but all at once without preparing myself was too much. I look at the skills I was supposed to have gained from my class. Perception Field. LV. 28. Provides an omnidirectional sense of all that is around the user. Skill level determines range and resolution. Distance. 
28 m. That is much less than the full 100 meters that assaulted me just a moment ago. Let's try just for a moment to see if it is less painful. I turn on the skill at the smallest possible size, 1 meter, and slowly expand it. It quickly grows to a dozen meters and more as hits the full 28 meters without any discomfort except a lingering pain. I notice a slight mental drag component to this skill. If I keep it up too long, I would probably start getting the headaches I got with the last perception field when I used it too much, but it also provided quite a bit less detail. I keep going through the log of my main class, and I see another interesting message. Level 25, Upgrade Perception Field. So, what I'm feeling is actually the upgraded perception field. It seems slightly better than what I got on the trial, but not by much. When I cross the level 50 barrier, will I get a new skill, or will I be stuck like this again? I look at my book. Is your information trustworthy? Yeah, I think so. Classes sounded really important, and looking at how high my EXP counter was climbing after only months on the instance, high-level people should be at least level 500, but probably much higher. I just hadn't started to run in bottlenecks that would make the advantages afforded by classes obvious. Without the perception field, both the skill and the upgrade would have been of enormous help to me. Anxious, I scroll thoughty interface looking for the skills from my subclass. Pando's Carrier. Unlocked skill slots. 1. 50% of 2 skills. Nature Control. Level 10 unlock. Active Nature Connection. Level 25 unlock. So I have to choose one of these skills? I look at them both not sure of what I should do for the moment, but after a minute the answer becomes obvious. Nature Control. I rely a lot on growing and moving roots around and I doubt that anything this Active Nature Connection can provide would be better than what I already have, but the other skill is different. Even an increase of a few percent in speed for roots and branches growth is enough reason for choosing it, and I may even be able to pay less attention to work with the roots. Something that will be very useful during fights. So I pick nature control and go to my next subclass straight away. Creator. Unlocked skill slots. 1. 50% of 2 skills. Imbue. Level 10 unlock. Create. Level 25 unlock. This time the choice is not so obvious. The names are too vague for my taste. I try to glean any other information, but this time, the system seems even more intent than usual on its stubbornness, and not even probing it with ether reveals the slightest smidge of information. After a couple of minutes, I stop and leave this choice for later. Maybe I can get some more information before picking one of the skills. Next, I open my stat screen. What changes have the subclass and levels brought me? Over a thousand mana and a massive increase in my soul stat. Hell, a massive increase in everything. I lay back and start going through all the other messages, but nothing very interesting shows up, so it only takes me another few minutes to empty my inbox. I shudder just thinking about the word. Done with that, I contact the village and ask when the attack is supposed to happen again. It will be later today. Or rather tomorrow, I think it's still before midnight. Could you do me a favor and look at the clock? A few moments later he returns and says, 30 minutes left in the day. Is the attack going to be at noon? Yeah, everything indicates that. Thank you. Twelve hours before I need to arrive back at the village. That is plenty of time. No longer worried about it, I start on something it can no longer wait, connecting to Pando's seat. I deepen our connection, all my awareness goes to our bond and the space surrounding us as his concern starts to fade faster. Everything is fine. I'm back. So, what have you been up to? As I find out, he was also subjected to the temporal effects of the trial. He feels older and more mature having learned much more than I expected even though she was by himself. Could I find a way to cheese the system and get more of this accelerated training time? Though it's more like leaving the slowed time zone. Why would the system even put us someplace where time passes slower? Even with the little I learned of magic, I know we have no hope of creating a space to manipulate the forces of time and space. But allowing some of the real time through in a small pocket of space sounds a lot easier and the runes I discovered on the trial should also help breathe life back to the currently stalled space slash time research. Opening my book, I start to go through it and confirm some of my hypotheses about the trial and the runes I copied. It might take longer than I was expecting, and if it took too long the money needed to remain on the instance would start to be a concern, but I would try anyway. During the time he was alone, Pando's seed seems to have learned how to be much more frugal with his mana use, and even better, he was getting more efficient which he is more than happy to demonstrate. After moving his roots and growing in different directions he finishes by drawing a hundred mana and forming a few droplets of water. My eyes widen. That shouldn't be possible. 
The system has a stranglehold on mana and magic. Before, the only thing he could do was move mana and use it to increase his growth. I also had the distinct feeling that he wasn't working with true nature mana, but being a plant himself gave some benefits. But this, this was real magic casting. I was trying to bypass some of the restrictions, but it seems the little guy was ahead of me. Perhaps he will also be able to start engraving and doing all sorts of other stuff in time, but even just independent casting opens up a whole world. If he learned to be more efficient with mana, we could become a real team. My runes and the advantage of the inner world are enough to provide some benefits like another caster at my side, but it depended heavily on preparation, but his help will be in real time. With a smile on my face, I continue reading my book looking for any new information it could provide about the situation and my conjectures. Half an hour later, after finishing the book and meditating on it for a while, I climb on my flying vehicle and start going around. The inner world may not have increased in size as much as I hoped for, but it still is dozens of times larger than before, with the very large requirements for soil that the size entails. Tons upon tons of dirt and other organic matter to decompose go into it. I try to change its shape, but I fail miserably. The size is reached is all that is available. I idly wonder if this size limitation was always in place. Shaking my head, I look at Pando Seed's work. He managed to hold the dirt so the whole thing didn't crumble against the bottom of the inner world. I spend the rest of the night going to plenty of places, and in a hurry, pulling most of the soil and plant matter in the spots where herbs were growing. It will take me a long time to fill it all if I want to do it with just this prime soil, but better I start sooner rather than later. I would never finish if I kept putting it off. The trip back to the village, even with my stops at a couple of dozen places, takes me less than six hours, and I arrive just as the sun is starting to peek through the sky. I have a lot to do if the attack is supposed to be at noon. Now let's get started. As I cross the gates, I finally let my new sense spread fully while limiting the detail. Though I don't use the knockoff version gifted to me by the system, but the one I attain myself and everywhere within 50 meters is within my awareness. Yes, this is what I'm supposed to feel. Everything comes to my awareness. In seconds, even the more muted version starts being too much, so I start experimenting with even lower resolution while trying to bring more detail just in specific regions around me. This is what the class is supposed to represent. To feel and know everything around me. To learn. To be aware.